Only 15% that watch my videos are subscribed. Please don't forget to if you like my content. This helps me out a lot. Enjoy the video. 27 June 1983, West Ware Road, Enfield, Massachusetts. Jeff Knox cracked open an eye to look at his alarm clock, the one he hadn't set the night before. His sleep-fogged brain registered the bright sunlight streaming in around his shade and curtains as he did so. 8.45, the bright red numbers read. Jeff sighed and burrowed back into his pillow. He allowed himself more time to wake up before rolling out of bed. He dropped to his floor and began his morning workout routine. Jeff began doing as many push-ups and sit-ups as his body would allow, not long after baseball season started, three months ago. He could now do close to 50 quick repetitions of each before his muscles began to fatigue, and he'd begun to see definition in those muscles. Today, Jeff planned to add a more visible piece to his exercise routine. Jeff hadn't told anyone at his former school about his exercise routine, nor how he wanted to change the direction of his life. Starting in the fourth grade, those in his class considered him a geek. At first, that was due to his slightly awkward social interactions with his classmates. As the years went by, that label stuck due to his increasing academic successes. While he was friendly with people at the public middle school, there wasn't anyone to whom he would apply the label of a friend. Jeff would start a new school in the fall, which would offer him a chance at making friends. Jeff got dressed, visited the bathroom, and headed downstairs to the kitchen. Morning, Mom, he said as he entered. Hey, Jeff, Marissa Knox replied from the breakfast nook, smiling at her oldest. Marisa loved sitting by the windows overlooking their expansive backyard, taking in the scene regardless of the weather or time of year. Great Quabbin Hill dominated that view. A native of nearby Pelham, Marissa shuddered when she remembered how Boston's growing thirst for water nearly destroyed the towns in this picturesque valley. No. What do you have planned for your first weekday of vacation? She asked as Jeff got himself a glass of OJ and a bowl of cereal. In contrast to the region's public schools, which let out for the summer on Friday the 24th, Private Tompkins School let out about a week and a half earlier. Marisa taught sixth grade math there. I'm going to bike over to the village and talk to someone at Quabbin Runners about running shoes and how to get started with a running program. I saw a help wanted sign in the window of Bilzerian's hardware, so I thought I'd stop in and check that out too, while I'm nearby. Not giving yourself any time off, are you? Marisa asked with a raised eyebrow. I know it looks that way, Mom, Jeff sighed, but I plan to do my workouts in the morning. That will give me plenty of time to do stuff during the rest of the day unless I wind up with a job at Bilzerian's. I'm trying out for the soccer team when I get to Tompkins. They've routinely got some of the best sports teams in the state, so I've got to be able to hang with the others if I want a chance to play. I'll need the extra stamina when hockey and baseball roll around too. Honey, Marisa said in an understanding voice, I just want you to be able to enjoy your summer, that's all. I will, Mom, Jeff assured her. It's just that going to Tompkins this fall will give me a new chance to make a first impression. I want to make a good one. Marisa smiled at her son. She saw his frustration over the last few years as he struggled to overcome the geek label. She prayed that Tompkins would be as good for him as he hoped. Are you going to be running on these roads? She asked. No, thanks. Jeff mumbled around a mouthful of cereal. At least not until I get used to running. The roads around here are too narrow for my taste. Even though I've ridden my bike on them for years, that thought still makes me nervous. I'll ride over to Tompkins and run on their track while I'm getting started, as long as it's not a problem. Problem? Marisa snorted. You've been in and out of that school your entire life. Almost the entire staff knows you. Jeff was going to be a faculty kid at Tompkins where his mother taught, something he wasn't sure he'd like. While Marisa and her husband Joe discussed keeping their kids in the public school system until they left for college, it was evident that academics wouldn't challenge Jeff and his younger sister Kara unless they went to a school as rigorous as Tompkins. He rinsed his cereal bowl and glass and put them in the dishwasher. The sink? Is that where they go? No, Mom. Jeff filled his bike's water bottle and set out for the Enfield Town Center. 
the bike ride from southeastern Enfield, known as Enfield Plains, to Enfield Village, the town center, was about a two and a half mile ride. People waved at Jeff as he passed, including people in their cars. This was something he enjoyed about the valley, the fact that everybody knew everybody, and he tried hard not to be a dirtbag because of that. He'd start high school in the fall, so he only had four more years to enjoy it. Even if he went to UMass, just a few towns to the west, he'd still have to move away from the valley he called home his whole life. Never a very populous region, census estimates put the population of the Swift River Valley towns at about 12,000 people. Zoning laws enacted in the wake of Boston's attempted land grab were strict. There were no malls, strip or otherwise, allowed in the four valley towns, Dana, Greenwich, Prescott, and Enfield. Neither were they allowed in four others nearby that also wanted to preserve their rural character, Petersham, New Salem, Shutesbury, and Pelham. The towns of Ware and Belchertown solicited the Commonwealth to improve Route 9 through their municipalities years ago, and strip malls abounded along that east-west road. The valley towns still harbored a strong distrust of state involvement in their region. Not all interactions between the state house and the region's communities were terrible, however. Boston was still quite responsive to requests from the area, thanks to constant reminders of what the state and the Metropolitan District Commission, the Water Rights Agency for Metro Boston, tried to do. One such example was that the Commonwealth approved requests to give the area's sheriff departments more police-like authority. The sheriff's departments mainly ran the jails in Massachusetts. The sheriffs now augmented local departments, which were almost a regional police force in and of themselves. Entering the Enfield Village District required Jeff to pay more attention to his riding. Traffic, such as traffic was in the valley, was heavier in the center of town. Where East Street joins Main Street, Jeff turned north on Main to follow routes 21 and 34. The road followed the general route of the Boston and Albany Railroad's old Athol branch line, which ran beside it. That branch line was now being repurposed as the B&A bike trail. Once in the center proper, Jeff waved to the firefighters working outside their station across Main Street. Many of their kids had been Jeff's classmates over the years. He parked his bike in front of the Quabbin Runner storefront and locked it to a post. Entering the former car dealership, Jeff recognized Mr. O'Mara, his gym teacher at Enfield Middle School, talking to another man. While the store name said Runners, Jeff saw a wide selection of equipment for all of the sports played in the area. Family stores abounded in the valley. Large chain stores were noticeably absent. Mr. O'Mara noticed Jeff approaching the dizzying display of running shoes on the back wall of the store. Well now, the older gentleman boomed, tis a good thing to see such a friendly face. Sean O'Mara held out his meaty hand and shook with Jeff. Hi, Mr. O'Mara. How was the first weekend of your summer? Boyo, I've retired from teaching, the man admitted, drawing a look of shock from Jeff. Retired? Tis true, I'm sorry to say. I didn't want a lot of fanfare when I finally decided to go. I did tell Mr. Davies ahead of time, but I turned to my papers this morning. Mr. Davies was the middle school's principal. Well, I feel sorry for the kids coming up behind me, Jeff said sadly. Your gym class was one of the more fun classes I had at Enfield Middle. What are you going to be doing now? If he makes it through training, he'll be my newest salesman, the younger man joked. Jeff, the man pretending to be a comedian over here is my oldest son, Tim. Tim, this fine young lad, is Jeff Knox. He'll be going to Tompkins next year. His ma teaches math there. Jeff shook hands with the younger Omara. Good to meet you, Jeff other than the opportunity to trade tall tales with this grumpy old Gus here. What brings you into my store today? Tim asked. I'd like to start running, Mr. O'Mara, but I don't know what kind of shoe is the best, how much they cost, or how to get started with a program. Then you've come to the right place, Jeff. The question isn't really what shoe is the best, though. It's what shoe is the best for you. That makes sense. Come over here so I can watch your feet as you run and figure out how to answer that question. What sport are you training for? Soccer this fall, but if there's a way to train for all three of the sports I play, that'd be great. What do you play? Soccer, hockey in the winter, and baseball in the spring. Baseball's always been my best sport. 
Tim O'Mara nodded as the trio walked to where the store set up a running area to evaluate customers. Tim asked Jeff to run a straight line barefoot. He watched how Jeff's feet and ankles reacted when his feet struck the ground. Tim had Jeff repeat the short runs a few times while Tim pointed out certain things to his father. As they walked back towards the shoes, Tim explained to Jeff what he saw during Jeff's run. They selected a pair of shoes, then Tim asked Jeff to run again. Damn, I'm good, Tim crowed. First try. Tim explained to Jeff how to start running. He also explained why, for Jeff's sports, Jeff wanted interval training, short bursts of sprinting mixed with jogging. He also agreed with Jeff's plan to run on the track at Tompkins as much as possible, especially while starting his running program. Jeff discovered the shoes that were the best for him were not all that expensive. Forty dollars later, Jeff was on the road to being in even better shape, no pun intended. Jeff secured his first job at the hardware store across the street. Mr. Bilzerian, Sr., was slowing down, and Mr. Bilzerian, Jr., would soon take over the day-to-day -day operation of the store. Young Mr. B knew he needed more employees to run the store efficiently, and hiring Jeff was his first step. Jeff agreed to work 10 a.m. to 4 p.m., Monday through Thursday, and 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. on Fridays. He'd start the following week as a general stock boy. He'd keep the shelves refilled and organized while earning minimum wage to start, the staggering rate of $3.35 an hour. Jeff would also have the opportunity to earn raises based on his job performance. With taxes taken out, he should clear about $65 a week. That wouldn't pay for college, but he could at least start saving towards it. Uh Jeff rode south through the center and toward Belchertown after leaving Bilzerian's. He pulled into a service station south of Quabbin Hill Road. The service tech at the desk smiled as he walked in. Jeff, Jerry called in his thick accent. Jersey. Jerry, Golbicki, was a first-generation immigrant to the United States and his dad's lead mechanic. How are you doing, Jerry? Good, good. Your dad in bay, he said as he motioned out to the floor of the shop. You go see. Thanks, Jerry. Jeff stepped carefully through the shop's work area until he found his dad, nodding at the other mechanics as he went. Four service bays and a good reputation kept his father's garage very busy. Jeff, his father exclaimed when he turned around. What brings you by? Hey, Dad, I was over at Quabbin Runners getting some running shoes and I just got a job at Bilzerian's. Thought I'd see how you were doing today since I didn't see you this morning. Joe Knox's eyebrows rose. A job? Geez, don't be in such a hurry to grow up, he joked. How much will you be working? Jeff told his father what his schedule would be, his hourly pay rate, and how he saw his schedule impacting his summer. Joe nodded. Well, it seems that you have things well planned. Don't burn yourself out. Don't worry, Dad, I won't. Let's talk about how to save all that money you'll earn. Jeff gulped air as he ran a third lap around the Tompkins track early the next morning. Sweat poured off of him and blood pounded in his ears. He felt a pretty sizable stitch in his side, too. Despite Tim O'Mara's warning not to be frustrated when he first started the program, Jeff found himself frustrated that he might not make one mile, let alone the two miles he hoped to do. But he was pushing himself harder than he normally did. Tim O'Mara also warned him that running was much different than cycling. Jeff hadn't been prepared for how different it would be. Remembering Tim O'Mara's words, Jeff kept at it running when he could, walking when he couldn't. Jeff pushed himself to put one foot in front of the other, determined not to fail. He ran most of the distance, walked some, and finished the two miles he challenged himself to do. The world record for the outdoor mile would survive another day. He willed himself to walk another half lap to some shade and collapsed onto the sparse grass under an oak tree. Way to stick to it, he heard a voice call out. Looking up as he lay on his back, Jeff saw Mr. Peter Romanov, the head soccer coach, approaching with an Enfield police officer he didn't recognize. They walked over from the parking lot beside the track. Jeff noticed an Enfield police cruiser tucked a few rows back. I thought that was you, Jeff, Mr. Romanov said. Jeff stood up to greet the two men, 
bent over with his hands on his knees. He waved. Jeff, this officer is Jack Dwachik. He just finished his orientation after transferring here from the Cambridge Police Department. Jack, this is Jeff Knox. He'll be starting here in the fall. His mother's been a math teacher at Tompkins for several years. Straightening up, Jeff dried his hand on a towel and reached out to shake hands. A pleasure to meet you, sir. Welcome to the valley. Thanks. Good to meet you too, Jeff, the young officer replied. Will you be trying out for the soccer team in the fall, Jeff? Mr. Romanov asked. Yes, sir, Jeff said. That's part of why I'm out here. I might get outplayed, but I'll be damned if I get outrun. That's the attitude I want to see from my players, Jeff. What position do you play? I enjoy midfield, sir, despite my current fitness level. I've had no problem keeping up with my man so far, but I don't think we ran as much as your players do at the high school level. You keep working hard this summer. I'd rather have a player with so-so skills who always gives 100% over a natural-born player who is lazy. Skill, we can work on. Heart, we can't. I don't have a problem starting freshmen either. That kind of work ethic will serve you well later in life too, Jeff, Officer Dwachik added. Would you mind a workout partner in the mornings? Jeff blinked. That sounded like an offer to help him out, and he'd only just met the man. That'd be great, sir. I'm on the graveyard shift right now, 11 at night to 7 in the morning. I can be here by 7.15 most mornings, as long as I don't get buried in reports from the night shift. Would that work for you? Yes, sir, Jeff said quickly. I usually do my push-ups and sit-ups after waking up. Should I keep doing that? Why don't you hold off until you get here in the morning, Jack Dwechik suggested. I'm sure you're doing things right but I can show you some other types of push-ups too. What are you doing now? Jeff explained when he'd started and how many of each he could do. Jack nodded. We can start tomorrow if you'd like. I'm on the night shift again tonight, but then I'm off for a few days before starting my shift rotation again. Having a workout partner on a consistent basis will help me out as well. Yes, please, Jeff replied, nodding. Another 30 minutes of sleep was always welcome. Delaying the start of his workout until 7.15 wouldn't cut into his day much, even when school started. He would easily make his scheduled shifts at Bilzerian's too. Good deal. I'll see you here by 7.15 tomorrow morning. If I'm not here on time, then I'm tied up with something. Start without me. Are you done working out for the day now? Yes, sir, I am. Coach mentioned that bike over by the parking lot is yours? Yes, sir, it is. We can load it into the trunk of my cruiser, and I can drop you off before I head back to the station. How's that sound? I won't turn that down, that's for sure. Good enough, Jack laughed. Jack and Jeff shared a good laugh at Marisa Knox's reaction to seeing her son climbing out of a police cruiser that first morning. She was upset until they let her off the hook, explaining the situation when she appeared to be about to explode. Jeff joined Jack Dwajic at the track every morning that summer, regardless of the weather. Jeff soon learned that Jack had been in the army as a military policeman. Jack introduced Jeff to wide arm and diamond push-ups and coached better form for his regular push-ups. After seeing his dedication, Peter Romanoff offered suggestions to Jack Dwachik for drills that Jeff could practice to improve his skills. Coach Romanoff wanted to work with Jeff one-on-one -on -one over the summer, but that would violate the Massachusetts Interscholastic Athletic Association rules. He was required to wait for the official start date for practices. Nevertheless, the coach saw significant improvement in Jeff's skills as the boy drilled himself after his conditioning sessions. Jeff's muscle definition increased, and his running reached a consistent three miles a day by the start of soccer tryouts. 29 to August 1983, Hardwick Road, Enfield, Massachusetts. Jeff leaned into the opposing player as they fought for the soccer ball. Sweat stung his eyes, and his lungs burned as they ran down the field. Jeff finally gained a step on his man and flicked the ball toward a player from his team. A whistle blew behind them, signaling the end of their turn, and both players returned to the back of the drill line. Nice job, the other boy offered as they jogged back to the rest of the midfielders. Thanks, Jeff answered, uh, I'm Tom Jarrett. Jeff Knox, he replied as they stopped at the water cooler. Knox? 
Does your mom work here by any chance? Sixth grade math, Jeff confirmed, nodding while they rejoined the line. Cool. She was my math teacher back then, Tom exclaimed. Hey, you're a freshman, right? My brother will be in your class this year. I'll look for him next week. Switching to the offense for his next turn, Jeff pulled away from his defender with ease. He sprinted away from the boy, angled toward the goal, and blasted a shot at the net. The goalie made the stop, but the defender should have kept Jeff from shooting at all. His counterpart said nothing to him as they returned to the line. Whatever, pal, Jeff thought. Some days you eat the bear, some days the bear eats you. Jeff gave 100% on the field and was not timid. Timid players got bench time, not playing time. Whatever Jeff was off the field was going to change. The second half of practice on Friday was all scrimmages. Jeff was always right on his man when defending and a step ahead on offense. The end of the final scrimmage approached when his defense cleared the ball. The ball sailed down the field rather than out towards the sideline. Jeff gauged the flight of the ball and broke for the opposing goal. The ball appeared over Jeff's right shoulder, landing on the pitch in front of him. He began to advance it down the field without breaking stride. He streaked by the other team's midfielder before that player could react. He put the ball through the legs of their left fullback and cut around him. The sweeper came over to defend him. The boy charged at Jeff and attempted a hard slide tackle. The sweeper slid toward Jeff while the ball was on Jeff's foot. Jeff popped it ahead of where the defender would be, leaped over him and flew down the now open field. The other team tried to catch up. The goalie and the boy playing stopper both closed in on him. Perfect, thought Jeff. Jeff flicked the ball across the field, causing the stopper to slip and fall when he tried to reverse direction. The goalie tracked the new path of the ball, but it was hopeless. Tom Jarrett ran flat out towards the goal down the opposite side of the field. He judged the speed of the ball and planted his foot in the proper place. The ball wasn't near him when he began his kick, but it rolled into the right spot as Tom's leg came forward. He launched a one-timer at the net. The goalie leaped for the shot, but it knuckled and sailed past him inside the right post. Tom and Jeff high-fived as the whistle blew. Hot damn, Coach Romanov thought as he smiled around his whistle. Those two are going to cut defenses apart. All right, deep breath. You can do this. Jeff coached himself while he pulled the door to his homeroom open. Head up, shoulders back, look people in the eye. Mrs. Elgin, his homeroom teacher, looked up at him as he entered. Jeff! She greeted him with a smile as he walked over to her desk. Welcome. How was your summer? Too short as always, Mrs. E, he responded. Very true, she said in agreement. When did your mom start getting ready for the school year? August 1st, same as every year, he grinned. Was it the same for you? I've been teaching a few years longer than your mother, Jeff. I've learned how to put off preparations until at least the 15th of August. Alice Elgin laughed. She'd been teaching for over 40 years. Do we have assigned seats in homeroom? He asked. We most certainly do, young man. She responded sternly, shaking a finger at him. Why chouse would reen should we let the ill informa choosey their own seating? Jeff laughed with her. Do you see that boy sitting there? Jeff turned in the direction she pointed. He turned back and nodded. Your seat is just to the left of him, his right if you're facing the front of the room. Thanks, Mrs. E. I'll go and introduce myself, if you excuse me. Jeff turned for the indicated seat, when she smiled and nodded. The already seated boy studied a map of the campus and compared it to his class schedule. That boy looked up when Jeff approached. You must be Tom Jarrett's brother, Jeff said. Yeah, I am, the boy confirmed, holding out his hand and smiling. I'm Jack Jarrett. Jeff Knox, good to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. How do you know Tom? Were you here for middle school? No, I play soccer, so we met last week at practice. Tom told me that he had my mother as his math teacher when he was in sixth grade, too. Your mom's a teacher here? Jack asked as Jeff sat. Yep, he confirmed. She's been teaching math here since I was three. But you're just starting Tompkins today. Yeah, I was in Enfield's public schools until last year. So you're from here? Sure am. 
I was born at the hospital in Greenwich and I've lived in the valley my whole life. What about you and Tom? We grew up in Williamstown. We were born in Burlington, Vermont before mom and dad decided to move south to Massachusetts. I wasn't old enough then to remember it. They chatted back and forth until the first bell rang. Both gathered their things and rose to head to their first class. Jeff noted that Jack walked with a pronounced limp, but kept his eyes on his new friend's eyes and said nothing about it. I'll grab a couple of seats for us at lunch, okay? Jeff asked. Sounds good, thanks. See? Jeff asked himself. That wasn't so hard, was it? Jeff walked into the cafeteria and grabbed a couple of seats at the end of a still empty table. He looked around the large room but didn't see Jack. So he sat and opened the brown bag he had brought to school. He looked up every so often to see if Jack was around. Jeff spotted Jack a few minutes later while the other freshmen moved through the lunch line. He checked again a few minutes later and saw that Jack was now at the checkout station. He also noticed that Jack didn't look happy. Jeff saw Jack looking around the lunchroom, so Jeff waved until Jack caught sight of him and nodded. He noticed another student following Jack as Jack began walking towards him. Jeff guessed the other boy was the source of Jack's displeasure. Jeff rose from the table as Jack approached. He nodded toward the table, then stepped between it and the other student when Jack passed him. Table's full, Jeff said in a brusque manner. Bullshit, the other boy spat. Nobody else is sitting here. Tough, you won't be either. Fuck you, the boy said, trying to get past Jeff, who continued to block him. Let me make it clearer. You're not welcome here. You're clearly bothering my friend. Go find somewhere else to sit. Jeff felt movement behind him. He shifted position and saw that other freshmen from the soccer team had occupied the rest of the seats at the table. See? Table's full, Jeff said again. Fuck you, asshole. The boy spat again. You'll get yours. Like you're gonna be the one giving it to me. Jeff snorted in reply. You'd best bring help if you try anything, Cosgrove, Jeff heard from behind him. A large portion of both the varsity and JV soccer teams now stood behind his table. None of the players looked happy. You give Jeff or his friend any crap, and you'll be explaining yourself to all of us, one of them said. The boy named Cosgrove snorted and walked away. Thanks for the backup, guys, Jeff said to his teammates. Keep your head on a swivel, Jeff. Nick Ansonia, a junior who played varsity defense, cautioned him. Nick was also the one who warned the other boy off. Brian Cosgrove, his older brother Jeremy, and their friends are major jerks. We've got your back, but beware of those times when you're not covered. Got it, Nick. Jeff's teammates nodded and headed off while Jeff sat back down and introduced the other frosh to Jack. Thanks, Jeff. Jack muttered across the table after the introductions. That kid wouldn't let up on me. Anytime, man. It was a car accident. What was? I got hit by a car while I was riding my bike. I was eight. That's why I walk like I do. Jack explained. I broke my hip and shattered my femur. That's the thigh bone. The femur healed fine. Except that it's about an inch shorter than the other one, and my hip sticks a little. <laughs> Jack, are you a dickhead? What? No, at least I try not to be. Jack responded, confused. Dude, that's all I care about, Jeff told his new friend. You didn't come across as one in homeroom, so I don't need to worry about anything else after that. Thanks, man. Brian Cosgrove hadn't learned his lesson well at all. Jeff shook his head at the sight of Cosgrove, and a few of his buddies cornering two other freshmen later the same day. Jeff pushed past the henchmen who formed the outer containment ring before stepping up to Cosgrove and his intended victims. Jeff was alone, but he felt that he could handle this group. He shoved Brian, causing him to turn. Did you think I'd forget about that nonsense back in the cafeteria? Jeff asked in a quiet voice. I don't like bullies. I despise them. Fuck you, pal. Cosgrove spat back. There's only one of you now. There's four of us. The girls Brian had been terrorizing kept flicking their gaze back and forth. It was like they were watching a tennis match. Oh, do you want to dance with me? Jeff asked after stepping closer. Because I'll be sure to take you out first. Whatever happens in the end, 
I will absolutely ruin your day before I'm done. Whatever you used to pull at whatever school you were at before coming to Tompkins isn't gonna fly here. If anything happens to these girls or anyone else in this school, I'm coming for you first. Jeff then gave him a hard stare. Cosgrove stepped back. Whatever, pal, he scoffed, trying to look tough for his accomplices. Come on, he ordered the others as he walked away from Jeff. Jeff wasn't sure where his new backbone came from, but he figured it developed when he decided to take charge of his life. He watched Cosgrove and his buddies leave while he shook his head once more. Ladies, do you need an escort to class? He asked, turning back to the two freshmen. There was nobody there. Jeff looked down the hall and saw the girls running away from the scene. He simply shrugged and turned to get to his class. Jeff burned off the anger from his confrontations with Brian Cosgrove at soccer practice. <laughs> Jeff looked around for Jack Jarrett when he entered the cafeteria for lunch the following Monday, but didn't see him right away. A pretty brunette sat at their usual table with someone. That person turned around and Jeff discovered that person was Jack. Jack saw his new friend, smiled and waved him over. Hey Jeff, Jack called when Jeff drew closer. Hey, Jeff answered back as he put his lunch down on the table next to Jack. Hi, I'm Jeff Knox, he said, smiling at the girl across the table. The girl smiled back and held out her hand, which Jeff shook. Hi, I'm Kathy Stein, she said. Are you in our class? Jeff asked as he sat. A freshman? I am, she confirmed with a nod. Welcome. How come you didn't start the year with us last week? My dad's a cardiologist who just started at GVMC, Kathy replied with a smile. We moved out here from LA at the beginning of August, but my folks wanted to make sure our family enjoyed at least part of summer vacation. We've been packing and unpacking for months. Mom found this gorgeous place right on the water up in Scarborough, Maine, when Dad started talking about moving us out of Southern California before last summer. They rented it for a month, straddling Labor Day, and we've been up there. Kathy sighed. It was wonderful. It was so much different after school had started up there, too. Jeff liked Kathy right away, for she seemed very genuine and honest. He also noticed during lunch that she seemed to have developed an interest in his friend. It might not be so wonderful when we get our first foot of snow, Jeff cautioned. Hey, Tom says you've been turning heads at soccer, Jack commented. Take no prisoners, that's my motto, Jack, Jeff grinned. Does that apply to Brian Cosgrove and his buddies too? Jack asked back with a knowing smile. That dickhead, Jeff muttered. Why? What have you heard? Only that you promised to take him apart at the seams if you catch him bothering anyone. That lardass doesn't have any seams. He's a solid piece of excrement. Who's Brian Cosgrove? Asked Kathy, who was still meeting the rest of her classmates. The member of the class of 1987, who is in the early lead for the biggest dickhead award at our graduation, Jeff said. He is at that, Jack laughed. He looked around the cafeteria and spotted the dickhead in question, pointing him out to Kathy. Him. Avoid him at all costs. I will, thanks. All the leaves are brown and the sky is gray. Jeff sang to himself two months later while he put books in his locker. Jeff couldn't honestly see any leaves on the trees or the ground, not since Mother Nature blessed them with a foot of snow over the previous weekend. The sky was, however, the color of lead, as the lyrics indicated. Jeff thought it might be warmer on the ice today since the outside temperature was an unusual 22 degrees Fahrenheit. It was normally in the high 40s near the end of October. All that now stood between Jeff and a good workout was a last period study hall. Jeff saw some movement to his right as he was about to close his locker. He discovered it was his two best friends, Kathy and Jack, when he looked closer. He was about to call out to them when he saw them step closer to each other and give each other a quick kiss. Whoa. Jeff thought, when did that happen? Jeff was by no means upset. He had thought that the two would make a good couple for some time. He was just startled by the sight. Jeff didn't remember seeing anything out of the ordinary over the last two months, despite the three having lunch together since the start of school. Kathy and Jack broke their clinch after another quick kiss. Kathy walked away from Jeff and Jack toward her last period class. 
Jack also had study hall and had to pass Jeff to get there. Jeff silently closed his locker and leaned against it while he waited for his friend. Jack watched Kathy walk away until she rounded a corner and disappeared. He turned to head to study hall and did a double take when he noticed his friend Jeff leaning against his locker with a bemused smile. Jack shook his head as he walked down the hall and came alongside Jeff. No wise-ass comments from you, fella, Jack warned him. Jeff looked hurt. Who me? He asked. Yes, you, you jerk, Jack grumbled back. Not it. Jeff threw an arm around his friend's shoulders as they continued down the hall towards their last class. Hey, bud, I'm happy for you two, really, Jeff told Jack in a serious tone. You know you two are my best friends, right? Yeah, Jack admitted. Thanks, Jeff. I was worried you might be upset that I was blocking you or something. Hey, I think Kathy's great and very pretty, but I'm not interested in her that way, Jeff admitted to Jack. So you're not going to move in on my girlfriend? Who me? Jeff repeated. The two laughed as they made their way to study hall. You guys will get him next year, Phil Detremont, the senior captain of the hockey team, said. The team members sat in the visitor's locker room at Amherst High School's rink, having just lost their last game of the year. Sure we will, sophomore Paul Benton muttered. Remember us little people when you and your BU teammates raise the bean pot next year, Phil, Jeff called out. Phil threw some wadded up tape at him. I gotta make the team first, he cautioned. I gotta go up against the guys who are already there and the other incoming freshmen. Those freshmen usually come from championship teams. So, Jeff snorted. Going five and 15 will make you that much more hungry. You'll blow those guys away, Phil. Phil gave him a nod and a smile as he began unlacing his skates. Jeff saw that the conversation was over and did the same. Phil waited for Jeff to leave the locker room and began to walk toward the bus with him. Hey, thanks for trying to keep things positive back there, he said to Jeff. Losing your last game of the year, last game of high school sucks. Don't let Benton bring you guys down if things get rough next year. I'm not worried about Benton. He'd be unhappy if he won the lottery. How many sports cliches do you want to hear? What do you mean? You know, you can't win them all. That's the price you pay if you want to play the game. And let's not forget my personal favorite. You guys will get them next year. Phil groaned. You want to get cross-checked, don't you? Are you guys doing anything for vacation? Kathy asked while the friends ate their lunch together in early March. Kathy's family would head back to Southern California to visit friends and family. Her family hadn't gone anywhere over the Christmas New Year's break. They also hadn't seen many of the people they were going to visit since they moved east. No, we're not doing anything this year, Jeff mumbled as he ate his sandwich. I'll be working at Bilzerian's for those two weeks. Jeff's family hadn't planned anything for the upcoming vacation, because his sister Kara was still in public school. Tompkins held their spring vacation over a single two-week period in mid-March, rather than over one week in February and one week in April, like public schools in Massachusetts did. Going away would be too difficult with two different school schedules to contend with. My family's headed north to do some skiing, Jack chimed in. Jack was excited, for skiing was the one sport he could participate in despite his leg. As long as he didn't have to ski through moguls all day, his hip and leg could take the exercise. He'd never come off a mountain if he had his way. Spring vacation means the baseball season is almost upon us, Jeff said, smiling. It'll be good to get back out under the sun. Sometimes I think you'll turn into a baseball as much as you've been talking about it, Jack joked while he threw a grape at his friend. Jeff caught it and popped it into his mouth. When are you going to start getting ready for the season? I'm still doing my daily workouts, naturally, Jeff said. I've been using a batting trainer at home since hockey ended. I've also been tossing a ball around with my dad for a couple of weeks. The snow melted away before the end of February. The winter had been mild despite the way it started. Joe and Jeff Knox ventured outside to throw baseballs as soon as the ground was clear. Jeff stacked 50-pound bags of ice melt at Bilzerian's Hardware about three weeks later. Since it was New England, snow was possible at any time through late May, though the increasing outdoor temperatures made needing ice melt less and less of a probable occurrence. 
He stretched and wiped his brow after placing the last bag on the stack. Jeff wondered how Jack and Kathy were each enjoying their vacations. He couldn't begrudge either the fun they were having with their families. Both of his friends worked hard at school. All three of the friends were near the top of their small class. Tompkins' class sizes were smaller than at local public schools, but the academics there were much more rigorous. You okay, Jeff? came Steve Bilzerian's voice. Jeff turned to find his boss walking towards him. No worries, Mr. B, Jeff responded. Just wondering how my friends are doing during their vacations. Where are they? the older man asked. One of my friends is up in Vermont, skiing with his family. The other's back out in California, where she's originally from. She moved out here at the beginning of August last year. To be honest, I was a little surprised when you came in last month asking if you could work during your vacation. Jeff shrugged. With mom and I at Tompkins and Kara still at Enfield Middle this year, it was a bit tough for us to plan a vacation. We'll head to Maine this summer instead. Steve Bilzerian nodded. Are you going to be coming back to work here this summer? Yes, sir, I'd like to, Jeff answered, nodding return. I can offer you a full 40-hour schedule at $4.15 an hour if you do come back. Jeff stared at the man in shock. Steve caught the look and asked, Jeff, do you understand how hard you work, especially compared to other high school kids we've hired in the past? Jeff continued to stare. Come on over here and sit down, Steve said, motioning to a row of five-gallon paint buckets. The pair sat after Steve turned two of them upside down. Jeff, I plan to hire two stock boys to do the work you do if you had decided not to come back. That's why I'm offering you the increase. Sir, that's 80 cents more an hour than I was making just a year ago. Less than a year ago, actually. You've earned it, Jeff, Steve Bilzerian replied. Honestly, I shouldn't have expected anything less once I found out that you were Joe Knox's son. Joe Knox's reputation for hard work was well known locally. Thank you very much, sir, Jeff answered. It was the only way he could. Jeff did the math in his head and realized Mr. B allowed him the chance to earn over $100 a week after taxes. A noticeable chill lingered in the air when baseball practice started a week later. Jeff ran back and forth across the outfield in an easy jog with the rest of his team to warm up. The ground was still soft under his feet, but it was firm enough that there was no mud bubbling up with each footfall. The coach called the group together after a few minutes. All right, gentlemen, let's have two lines about 10 yards apart and let's get some soft toss started. There wouldn't be any hard throwing for about a week. It would take that long for their arms to become accustomed to that sort of activity. It wouldn't look good to have players blowing out their shoulders on the first day of practice. After the soft toss came base running practice. Many freshmen there for the tryouts gulped air after warmups and the easy jogs around the base paths. Jeff was the exception. He now did 150 push-ups and sit-ups a day, along with running close to three miles. The workout the baseball team had gone through so far wasn't much in comparison. The coaching staff noticed his stamina, though there were no comments made aloud. Not yet. Is he going to make us run all day? Bill Sampson gasped as the baseball team started their fifth circuit of the playing fields at Tompkins. Their last game had been a disaster, and Coach Kessler was teaching them about mental focus. Probably, Jeff said as he came alongside the slower runner. A month into the season, we shouldn't be making the mistakes we made yesterday. No, don't stop, Bill, he cautioned when Samson started to slow. It'll hurt worse if you do. What are you, a machine or something? We've only gone about two miles, Jeff commented, shrugging. I usually run about three or four a day. Jeff grunted when he landed on the outfield grass. He scrambled to his feet and threw the baseball to the shortstop, keeping the base runner at first. It was the third inning in the next to last game and Coach Kessler had tapped him to start left field today. Jeff brushed himself off and returned to his position. That's the third or fourth ball I've had to dive for, Jeff thought to himself as he did. That doesn't even take into account the fly balls I've caught. They've already got Bill's number today for sure. Lay off the high ones, Tom Jarrett cautioned while Jeff put on his batting helmet. Tompkins trailed 3-1 to one in the bottom of the seventh inning 
but they were beginning to rally and had two men on base. Jeff nodded and headed to the on-deck circle. He'd struck out twice already in the game on high pitches. And the batter in front of him struck out for the first out of the inning. A double play ball would end the game. Jeff stepped into the batter's box and got himself ready. High pitches were all Jeff saw for the first three pitches thrown, but he didn't chase them. Jeff looked at his coach for the sign and blinked when he received, swing away. The opposing pitcher tried to blow a 3-0 fastball by him, but Jeff had been waiting on just that pitch. He drove the ball deep into the right center field gap, catching the outfielders flat-footed. Jeff dropped the bat, sprinted away from home and dug hard for first. He stepped on the inside corner of the bag and kept going. A line drive into the gap was a near guaranteed double. Jeff looked at Coach Kessler in the third base coach's box and saw the man pinwheeling his arm, signaling Jeff to continue to third base. Jeff didn't slow. His cleats threw dirt as he continued around second and sped towards third. Jeff stole a glance towards the outfield while he rounded the bag. Their center fielder was just getting to the ball. Jeff heard the other team yelling instructions behind him as he concentrated on running. He saw Coach Kessler signaling to slide to the inside of the bag. Jeff leaned forward and launched himself at third. His right hand reached for the bag and hooked his forearm around it so he wouldn't overshoot. Jeff held on as his momentum swung him around. The third baseman slapped the tag down. Safe, the umpire yelled, causing the Tompkins fans to cheer wildly at the bang-bang play. Jeff asked for time, and the umpire granted it. Coach Kessler slapped him on the helmet while he brushed off the dirt from the base path. Good job, Jeff. Nice hustle. Thanks, coach, he answered, stepping back onto third. Okay, still just one out, and now we're tied 3-3 three three thanks to that hit. We may win this one yet. Tom Jarrett stepped up to the plate and dug his cleats into the box as he stared out at the pitcher. The other coach encouraged his pitcher from the dugout, but the last hit rattled the kid. Tom blasted the first pitch he saw back over the pitcher's head and into center field. Jeff trotted home with the winning run. Nice game, kid, Tom said later while they carried equipment back to the gym. Thanks. That hit felt pretty good. How's your head? Tom asked with a grin. I think my ears are still ringing from people slapping my helmet. That's what happens when you lay off the high ones. It's too bad we were eliminated from the playoffs a few weeks ago, or that the season wasn't a little longer. We're finally looking pretty good. Like the Sox say, Tom, there's always next year. Well, our freshman year is just about over, Kathy noted while the group of friends walked through the halls during the last week of school in May. Yep, agreed Jack. All that stands between us and vacation is the wonderful experience of exams. Should be fun, Jeff added. Like you have anything to worry about, Jack retorted. You could skip the next two weeks of school, and you'd still get an A in Senora Alcala's class. Isabel Alcala was Jeff's Spanish teacher. Not that you won't be getting straight A's. And you two won't? Jeff asked his friends as they all entered the cafeteria. A month later, while Jeff worked his full-time shifts at Bilzerian's, his report card came to his house. It proved his friend's prediction right. I see plenty of clouds, but I don't see any silver linings, Jeff thought to himself as he glanced outside. Vacationing in Millbridge, Maine was great, but there wasn't much to do if the weather didn't cooperate. Overcast and 60 was a far cry from the sunny and 90s of the past few days. Jeff walked back to the couch and picked up his book again. He was feeling pretty proud of himself. He was no longer a freshman. His report card arrived with straight A's, and he'd gotten another raise at Bilzerian's. Life was good. Jeff heard Kara's door open upstairs and her footsteps approach the stairs. She pounded down them wearing a sweatshirt and long pants. She tore open the door and slammed it behind her. Jeff could see her striding down the walk through the window but lost sight of her as she turned towards the ocean. She looked pissed off about something. What's eating her? Jeff wondered a moment before his earlier good mood evaporated. Jeff ran up to his room, pulled on a sweatshirt and bolted out of the house. He couldn't see Kara when he reached the street. He tried to think of where Kara might have gone, but remembered where he saw her sitting, many times over the last few days. He jogged towards the small beach the family had enjoyed during their stay. Kara sat on the jetty, 
looking out over the ocean from the rocks there. He watched from the edge of the road for a few moments, but she didn't move. He carefully made his way out along the rocks. Kara, Jeff called when he reached her. His sister turned and squinted up at him, but said nothing. Is it okay if I sit down here and talk to you? The look on her face suggested that wouldn't be her first choice, but she just shrugged. He decided that wasn't a no, so he sat. It was a few minutes before either of them said anything. Kara, I want to apologize to you, Jeff finally said. Kara glanced at him with a neutral look. For what? she asked. I haven't treated you very well over the past year. She kept quiet when he paused, so he pressed forward. I guess I was so focused on trying to change who I was before I got to Tompkins that I kept changing until I turned into a jerk. A self-absorbed jerk. Why do you say that? she asked. That you're a jerk? When we were younger, we used to spend hours in the woods behind the house exploring together. We used to spend almost as much time trying to figure out some way to pull pranks on mom or dad. In the winter, we'd spend hours having snowball fights or sledding together. There weren't many other kids who grew up near us, so we were always with one another. I stopped doing all of that this past year. I abandoned you. The ten minutes we've been sitting here together might be the longest we've voluntarily spent together in all of that time. Kara turned to look back at the ocean again. She was silent for many moments, so Jeff held his tongue. He also turned back to the water. Jeff figured she was preparing a response, but Kara surprised him with a punch to the shoulder. The force of the impact surprised him. I hate you, she screamed at him while tears rolled down her face. You get a job, go off to another school, make new friends, and leave me all alone? You left me behind like some day-old newspaper you already read. I was drowning in your wake, I was lost. Jeff had never seen Kara so mad. You totally changed. You stopped being the shy brother I could talk to and turned into a confident boy who didn't seem to need me anymore. What did I do, Jeff? Huh? Tell me. What did I do? Kara buried her face in her hands and began sobbing, the sound audible over the crash of the nearby waves. Jeff tried to hug her, not quite knowing what else to do. Kara twisted out of his grasp and began hitting him in the chest over and over. His sister may have been the quiet, artistic type, but she inherited enough of their father's strong build for the punches to hurt. The venom she loosed on him stung more than the blows that rained down. Jeff reached past the flailing arms and pulled his little sister into the hug he tried to give her earlier. He pulled her close enough that she had to stop hitting him. Kara continued to sob and tucked her arms to her chest as he drew her to his. You did nothing wrong, Kara, he assured her. It was all my fault. Kara cried louder. I'm sorry, he whispered over and over. Jeff held his little sister for some time. 27th August 1984, Hardwick Road, Enfield, Massachusetts. Jeff gulped down his water and readied himself for his next turn at the current drill at soccer practice. He'd square off against Nick Ansoina, now a senior and co-captain of the soccer team. They watched Tom Jarrett and a freshman race after the ball, each jockeying for position. <coughs> Man, they're really banging away at each other, aren't they? Nick asked as he looked down the field. That kid isn't taking it easy on Tom, that's for sure. There's one in every bunch, Jeff joked in reply. That was you last year, you know, Nick reminded Jeff, facing him now. Huh? That was you. Nick repeated. You and Tom fought your way down the whole sideline, and you're right, there is one in every bunch. That was me my freshman year, it was Tom two years ago, and that was you last year. Your refusing to give up during this drill last year was a big reason why you got as much playing time as you did last season. You'll be captain your senior year, if not before. Jeff wasn't sure how to answer that. Jeff didn't have a chance to meet the freshman he commented about until the scrimmage at the end of practice. They were part of their team's midfield together. Hey, Jeff greeted his teammate while he held out a hand. I'm Jeff Knox. Chris Miklich, the freshman responded as they shook. Where are you from? My family just moved to Palmer from outside Lansing, Michigan. Dad got a new job in Springfield this summer. Well, the valley's not anywhere near our beloved Commonwealth's capital, but we prefer it that way. 
The valley? The Swift River Valley, which is technically Enfield, Greenwich, Prescott, and Dana. It's not pronounced Greenwich? Nope. Greenwich? We're a bit different around these parts. Chris laughed. I was glad that my folks at least picked a school with a hockey team. Is it any good? Jeff shrugged. We weren't last year 5 and 15, but a lot of those games could have gone either way. We need the breaks to go our way and we'll be pretty good. The whistle blew. Today, ladies, called Coach Romanov. They quickly got back into their positions. Hey, Jeff, a voice called to him the next week. Jeff turned from his locker and saw his friend Jack Jarrett walking toward him. Jack wore a broad smile on his face while holding an arm around Kathy Stein, his girlfriend of nine months. The young brunette invited Jack to her family's summer house in August. Jeff hadn't seen the couple since mid-July due to the timing of their vacation, his family's. Jack and Kathy left for Maine the same day the Knoxes returned home. Well, look at you two, Jeff quipped. Both of you look very happy and disgustingly tanned. And you're not, Kathy shot back. You look like you were outside for hours every day yourself. Well, Jeff began. Okay, fine, I was outside a lot despite my hours at Bilzerian's. How was Maine? Other than the crazy tourists, it was great, Kathy replied. Um, aren't you guys crazy tourists when you go up there, Kath? Yeah, okay. A beautiful blonde Jeff didn't recognize passing by distracted him. She chatted with a group of girls he recognized from the junior class as they walked down the hall. Jeff managed not to let his mouth hang open, but he couldn't stop staring at her. She was spectacular. Jeff? Jeff? Jack tried to get his attention. Jeff looked back at his friends. Sorry, he said, a sheepish look on his face. Kathy laughed at him, having seen Jeff's reaction to the blonde. You met Chris Miklich last week during soccer practice, right? Jack asked. Yeah, Jeff answered, wondering how Jack had already heard of him. Tom told me about him, Jack explained. That's his older sister, Pauline. She's in Tom's class. Wow, Jeff whispered clearly taken with the older girl. Yeah, definitely not a butterface, Kathy muttered. A butterface was a girl who looked pretty until she turned around. She had a fine body, but her face... Older and out of my league then, Jeff sighed. You never know until you try, big boy, Kathy teased. That's one of the areas I don't have a lot of confidence in, Kathy. You know that. And that's something I totally don't get. She said, you're friends with just about everybody. Any girls I'm friends with I've known for years, Jeff reminded Kathy. You're the exception, Kath. You'd already met this guy here, and now you're his girlfriend. There's no pressure with you. This girl's different. The soccer players talked about many things while cleaning up after practices. One locker room debate after practice early in the year started the players thinking. It also helped them start to gel as a team. Jeff was right in the middle of the discussion. Why do we need to worry about those kids? Asked Deke Muller, a starting forward and a senior this year. Deke, do you like music? Jeff asked in return. What? I thought we were talking about the geeks. Bear with me, do you like listening to music? On a turntable? Maybe on a tape player? Yeah. How about talking to your girlfriend on the phone? Picking her up in your car to go somewhere? not having to go to bed when the sun sets because you can turn on a light. Yeah. Who do you think thought up all that stuff? The geeks, right? Yeah, I guess, Deke admitted. Deke, I'm a geek, Jeff told him. I have been for years. In fact, I got straight A's on my final report card last year. Deke just blinked at him. I'm probably near the top of my class right now. But, but, you're a soccer player, a jock, Deke exclaimed shocked. Yeah, so? Jeff shrugged. Why do the two have to be separate? When I leave Tompkins, that might be the end of me ever playing sports competitively again. There may be people at this school who will go on to college sports, or maybe even get to the pros, but this will be it for the majority of us. So why shouldn't we work hard, learn as much as we can as well as we can so we have more choices later in life? Anyone can be a dick. Just look at Brian Cosgrove. How much will that cost you later in life? How much will it gain for you not to be? Deke looked thoughtful, as did the others who heard Jeff's argument, so Jeff kept going. 
You guys know Tom has a little brother, right? He asked, indicating Tom Jarrett. Many of his teammates nodded. Jack's probably my best friend, with Kathy Stein a close second. With his medical problems, Jack will never play sports, and Kathy's chosen not to. Does that matter to me? No. I have the same sense of humor as they do, and we like hanging out together. End of story. You guys backed me up last year when I squared off with Cosgrove on the first day of school, and you'd only known me a week. There are only about 300 of us in high school here. Why are we splitting ourselves into such small, divisive groups? Talk to these kids, make them see you're nothing like they probably thought you were. Jeff climbed off the soapbox. He let his teammates roll his words around in their heads while he finished dressing. Tom Jarrett caught up to him as he walked out to the parking lot to catch his ride home. Nice sermon, Reverend, Tom joked as he shoved him gently. Why should Jack and Kathy and the others who don't play sports be treated like that, Tom? Jeff asked in a not-so-joking manner. You know I'd be treated like them if I didn't play a sport. Easy, man, Tom said in a soothing tone. You're preaching to the choir, okay? Sorry, Tom, it pisses me off. Really hadn't noticed. Tom almost fell over laughing when Jeff shoved him. In his office, Coach Romanoff smiled to himself after overhearing Jeff's speech. The sophomore grinned at the three freshmen. It was a cruel smile. With his buddies behind him backing him up, he was sure that the three younger kids would soon piss their pants. He'd just about gotten the frosh to the point where they'd hand over their lunch money when he heard a scuffle behind him. Someone swatted a stinging slap to the back of his head. That person was going to die. Spinning around, he nearly shit his pants when he saw who slapped him. Hi, Brian, Jeff Knox growled through gritted teeth. Did you have a nice summer? Brian Cosgrove had stayed in the shadows last year, avoiding Jeff since their first confrontation. He decided to take a chance this year and poke at his heat up to see what he could get away with. Cosgrove glanced around and saw Jeff's teammates bracing his buddies. Many teammates. <laughs> the other teams at school heard about Jeff's little speech, and they responded to the unspoken challenge. The bullying business at Tompkins had suddenly become much more dangerous. Seeing Jeff... Brian knew he was about to be hammered back down into his hole. He looked at Jeff with a much less arrogant attitude. -y. What I told you last year is still in effect, Jeff whispered to him so softly that only Brian could hear. We haven't been back in school a month and already you've managed to piss me off. Nice work. Jeff looked over at the three younger students. Guys, if this person here, and I use the term person loosely, bothers you again, you come find me. Any of my teammates, or any of the other jocks here, will handle the problem, okay? The three freshmen nodded nervously, not quite believing that an older student would stick up for them. Their dealings with upperclassmen so far hadn't shown them anything like that. The freshmen saw the student who stuck up for them give the bully a hard look before waving them down the hall. That's strike two, Jeff warned Cosgrove after the younger students left. You don't want to know what happens when you strike out. Jeff worked on his French homework at the kitchen table beside Kara before dinner one night. This year, he took both Spanish 2 and French 1 on the enthusiastic recommendation of Isabel Alcala. Kara chose French as her language, so they were in the same beginner's class together. She found Jeff's study methods and his discipline were something to emulate. With the burden of an extra class this year, Jeff needed to study whenever he could. His mother tousled his hair while the siblings worked at the kitchen table. Mom, you're killing my chance with the ladies, he complained, trying to straighten his hair while Kara laughed at him. Who? she asked. Your sister? Me? This kitchen isn't exactly a target-rich environment, as you kids say. Yeah. You're the one that keeps telling me to be ready when opportunity knocks, he responded. How can I be ready for my adoring fans if I look like I just woke up? Relax, Romeo. The bouncer at the door will let us know when they start lining up for you. It's time to put away Le Francais and set the table. Tompkins students rarely attended away games, and today was no exception as they visited Petersham Preparatory Academy. In contrast, PPA students made up most of the spectators present and were a rowdy bunch. PPA students made a lot of noise at the moment because the referee whistled their team for a foul seconds before halftime. 
the interference foul happened outside the penalty area, and the referee awarded Tompkins an indirect free kick. Two players had to touch the ball before a goal would count. Nick Ansonia waited next to Jeff while the referee paced off the 10-yard exclusion zone for PPA. Nick and Jeff talked over the play one more time. It was a common play that everyone used, but every once in a while it did work. The referee raised his arm and blew the whistle. Nick nodded to Jeff and ran towards the ball. When he stepped over it, he bumped it back towards Jeff. The ball made the required one full revolution for the play to be legal. Jeff was already sprinting towards the ball and blasted a shot toward the goal. The ball looked to be going wide of the far post, but PPA's goalie saw the ball spin and he broke as hard as he could for the back post where one of his defensemen stood. Jeff placed his shot well. Sideline spectators watched the shot arc towards the net. PPA's defenseman leaped for it, hoping to head it away. The goalie dove to intercept the ball, stretching out, trying to bat it away. Jeff's target was the net's top corner on the far side. The spinning ball broke for that corner as it arced through the air. The ball hit the goalpost just above the defenseman's head, beyond the diving goalie's reach. It caught the inside edge of bouncing it back inside the goal. The net rippled with the ball's impact. Tompkins players cheered and gathered around Jeff to congratulate him on the shot. He'd scored the first goal of the game. Great shot, Pelé, Nick said with an arm around Jeff's neck. Still a lot of soccer to play, wise guy, Jeff cautioned. Doesn't mean it wasn't a sweet shot. Jeff rolled his eyes but smiled back at his teammate. It was, wasn't it? October gave way to November and soccer gave way to hockey. Jeff paired with a freshman on defense since he was the third-line defenseman from the previous year. That freshman was Chris Miklich. The two connected as line mates instantly. Oh my word, and muttered John Kessler, the head hockey coach for Tompkins. He watched his third-line defense pick apart his first-line offense. Chris and Jeff seemed to know where the other would be without a word, with hardly a glance, and they'd never played together before. Coach Kessler watched them control the ice as practice progressed. He watched the emergence of his new first-line defense. <laughs> Jeff and Chris walked down the hall of the Jenkins building together a week later. The school day had ended, and they reviewed hockey plays on their way to practice. Jeff had the skills, but he'd only been playing for a few years. Chris had better hockey instincts, and he pointed out certain things to Jeff as they walked. Hey, Chris! A female voice called. The pair stopped and turned to see Chris's sister, Pauline, walking towards them, smiling. Jeff had been checking Pauline out since the first day of school, but he'd yet to talk to her. He decided to keep his mouth shut unless spoken to so he wouldn't make a fool of himself. Hey, I forgot to tell you this morning, but Dad needs a new copy of your hockey schedule. He can't find the other one, and he wants to be sure he makes the home games. No problem, Chris answered. I'll make sure I ask coach for one before practice starts. Seeing his partner eyeing Pauline, but trying hard to look like he wasn't, Chris introduced them to each other. Pauline, this is my partner on defense, Jeff Knox. He's a sophomore. Jeff, this is my big sister, Pauline. She's a junior here. Hi, Jeff, Pauline said in a bright voice. It's nice to meet you. <sighs> Hi, P. Pauline. I, 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 it's nice to m m meet you he stammered. He sighed, thinking, so much for not making a fool of myself. Chris stared at his partner before turning back to Pauline. Hey, I'm sorry, sis, but we've got to get to practice. I'll see you at home. Sure, Chris, Pauline said thoughtfully. Jeff was looking anywhere but at Pauline. Come on, guy, before we're late, Chris said to Jeff, grabbing Jeff by the elbow. He led Jeff away from an amused Pauline. Chris looked at his friend once they were outside, headed for the field house. Okay, what the hell was that? What? You looking all embarrassed in front of my sister? Jeff sighed, knowing Chris wouldn't let this go. It was best to get it out in the open now. Look, Chris, I noticed your sister on the first day of school. I mean, she's beautiful. How could I not notice her? Beautiful? My sister's hot, Chris joked before realizing the problem. Hey, wait a minute, you've got a crush on my sister, he exclaimed. Jeff sighed again. Chris, please don't say anything to her, okay? She probably thinks I'm an idiot now. Oh, she does not. She's a bit confused right now, that's for sure. 
I mean, she's heard about what a great guy you are and how confident you are since we started here. So maybe the stammering fool routine she just saw has thrown her for a loop. I doubt she thinks you're an idiot, though. Mentally challenged, maybe, but not an idiot. Jeff chuckled along with Chris. Okay, so maybe not an idiot. But you have to admit that I came across looking pretty stupid. Jeff, in all seriousness, she's a nice person. Just talk to her, okay? Okay, he sighed yet again. I'll talk to her tomorrow. Chris clapped him on the shoulder as they reached the field house doors. It'll be fine. Jeff approached Pauline before school the following day as she put her things away in her locker. Jeff wiped his sweaty palms on his pants as he crossed the hallway towards her and prayed he wouldn't make a fool out of himself again. He excuse me? Pauline? Ma Pauline turned to see the boy her brother had tried to introduce yesterday looking at her. His embarrassed look from yesterday was gone replaced by a hopeful one. She smiled. Hi, Jeff. Hey, look, Pauline, I wanted to apologize for how I acted yesterday. I'm not all that used to talking to girls I don't know, especially girls as beautiful as you. You're a silver-tongued devil, aren't you? Pauline laughed. Jeff liked the sound of her laughter. Not usually, Jeff grinned. I'm just trying to make up for yesterday. It's fine, Jeff. Pauline replied, putting her hand on Jeff's elbow. It gave him a bit of a rush. Is my brother giving you any problems? More like your brother is making me look good, Jeff chuckled. We click on the ice. I'm glad. Pauline cocked her head. May I ask you to walk me to class, sir? I would be delighted, miss, Jeff replied, crooking his elbow and bowing slightly. Pauline closed her locker and slipped her hand through Jeff's arm, resting it on his forearm. Jeff nodded to her, and they were off. Jeff escorted Pauline to her class without incident. He was so intent on looking at her that he didn't see people staring at them in disbelief. Jeff found Pauline to be as easy to talk to as his sister Kara, once he relaxed. Pauline found he could make her laugh often. They were both disappointed when they reached her classroom. Sadly, we have arrived, milady. Jeff intoned, putting on a long face. Be not sad, good sir, she replied. We shall see each other again on the morrow. Until then, milady, Jeff offered with a sweeping bow. Pauline answered with a curtsy before they parted ways, both laughing at their silliness. The girls she hung around with since starting at Tompkins surrounded Pauline when she walked into English class. What are you doing walking with Jeff Knox? Marcia Grindel asked in an accusing tone. Why wouldn't I? Pauline snapped back. He's a geek, Paulette Dubois replied as if that explained everything. He plays hockey with my brother, Pauline responded. I'll be seeing him quite a lot, so we're getting to know each other. Why do you guys care? Because hanging around with a geek will ruin your reputation, Marcia shot back. Pauline pursed her lips but held her tongue. There was no way she would let others choose her friends for her. You actually come to your brother's hockey practices? Jeff joked while he climbed the field house bleachers that overlooked the ice rink. He came to collect his sister before they walked down to their mother's classroom. Jeff was a little surprised Kara hadn't waited for him in the much warmer lobby. I asked your sister that same question when I saw her sitting here, Pauline answered with a laugh. And she told you we'll be walking down to our mother's classroom to catch a ride home, right? Yep, just like I'll wait for Chris to finish from now on so we can drive home together. Talking to Kara was much nicer than trying to get my homework done. That it is, Jeff said, smiling at Kara. I forgot that last year. What's that? Pauline asked. I'll tell you about it tomorrow, Pauline, Kara said while she stood. It'll take too long to tell you the story tonight and I want to get out of this giant icebox and head home. The trio said goodnight to each other when they parted. Snake Kara bumped shoulders with her brother while they traversed the halls. Jeff looked over at her. I like her, Kara said. Yeah. How bad? She grinned. Pretty bad, he admitted. I think I've had a crush on her since I first saw her. She's very pretty, Jeff laughed. You know what Chris said when I finally admitted to him that I thought she was beautiful? Kara shook her head. He said, Beautiful? My sister's hot. 
Kara's laughter echoed down the halls. I can see him saying that. She is hot, that's for sure. What are you going to do about it? Not much until I get to know her a lot more. Can I elicit some sisterly advice later? I don't know, can you? Kara asked, a mischievous twinkle in her eye. Do you want me to see if you fit in a trash can upside down? Again? The crowd rooting for the underdog Tompkins School Black Bears let out a roar when the scoreboard clock ran out, ending the game and the season for the Ashburnham Prep Narwhal. Tompkins had just won the Western Massachusetts Division II hockey tournament. They would play in the state semifinals at the Boston Garden in a week. The Tompkins celebration was quick and muted in deference to their hosts, who just lost at home. The Black Bears quickly lined up to shake hands. That done, they filed off the ice quietly, securing their reputation as good sportsmen. Coach Kessler gave a quick speech. <laughs> he reminded them that they needed another two wins to become state champions. <laughs> the team showered and dressed quietly, <laughs> knowing that Ashburnham's locker room was right next to theirs. <laughs> Kessler called out to Jeff and Chris when they filed out of the visitor's locker room. <gasps> Knox, Miklich, over here, gentlemen. The defensive pair peeled off toward the side hallway where Coach Kessler beaconed. Their jaws dropped when they saw who stood with their coach. Jean Renoir, the Boston Bruins star defenseman, waited for them. Gentlemen, I'd like you to meet Jean Renoir, though I'm sure you know who he is. His son will attend prep next year. Mr. Renoir, these young gentlemen are my first-line defensemen, Jeff Knox and Chris Miklix. Renoir held out his hand, and the boys dropped their bags and sticks to shake the hand of their idol. You boys played a hell of a game, Gene said. I think you made sure your team would win that game a few times over. Thank you, sir, Jeff replied. Everyone did their part to win, though. If you'll excuse me for saying so. And they're humble on top of it all, Gene asked their coach. There's a reason why Jeff wears the A on his jersey as a sophomore, Coach Kessler replied. The group is responsible if they play well, and he's responsible if they don't. Renoir raised an eyebrow. You're only a sophomore? Yes, sir, but Chris is a freshman. His hockey skills and instincts are better than mine. He's taught me a lot this year. Your first line defensive pair could be together for two more seasons? Gene asked the coach. Merd. Yep, our offensive lines might not be as strong next year, but the defense will be solid. Coach Kessler turned back to his players. You guys head out to the bus. I'm sure your families want to see you. Yes, sir, Jeff answered, then turned to Jean Renoir. It was very nice to meet you, sir. Jean shook hands with the two again before they picked up their bags and sticks and walked out to the waiting bus. The two teams were exhausted after almost 80 minutes of hockey. Don Bosco Technical High School's players hadn't expected an easy game against the Tompkins Black Bears, but they hadn't expected their opponents to skate with them, stride for stride deep into an overtime period either. The game was deadlocked at one goal each, while the final minutes of overtime ticked down. The puck bounced and slid up and down the ice as it had throughout the game, with neither team ever gaining any significant advantage. The Division II State Hockey Championship match at Boston Garden found fully three quarters of the seats filled with Bosco fans. The Tompkins fans gave no ground, however, roaring support for their Black Bears. Tompkins had the puck pinned in the Don Bosco defensive end when the clock entered the final minute of overtime. The referee's arm shot up without a whistle, indicating a pending, delayed penalty against Bosco. The Tompkins goalie saw this and immediately broke for the bench, letting an extra attacker join their frenzied last-second attempt to score. Chris Miklich took the ice. Coach K split his and Jeff Knox's pairing due to an injury on another line in their semifinal game. Chris skated hard. He streaked into the zone from the left point. He slapped his stick loudly on the ice, calling for a pass. Jeff saw the puck squirt out to him at the right point. He circled around it to get it on his forehand side. Burner! Burner! Chris yelled over the crowd's noise while glancing at the clock. Chris called for a low, hard slap shot they called an ice burner. Jeff drew his stick back and blasted one toward the net. It wasn't a shot on goal, but a hard pass aimed just wide of the net to the left side. Chris Miklich charged in from the left slot and extended his stick at the last second to tip the puck into the net, just as he and Jeff had practiced. 
The puck shot up under the crossbar and sent the Don Bosco goalie's water bottle flying, as if hit by a rifle shot. Sticks dropped to the ice and gloves flew into the air as the game-ending buzzer sounded. The Tompkins players leaped from the bench onto the ice to chase down Chris Micklitz. They buried him under 24 exuberant bodies. The Don Bosco players collapsed to the ice in exhaustion and disappointment. Their coach had to prod them into the traditional handshake line. The hundreds of Valley residents who made the two-hour trek to the garden shot to their feet and screamed themselves hoarse, while the Bosco fans sat in stunned silence. The Tompkins players lined up to shake hands. Several Bosco players stopped Jeff and Chris to congratulate them, admitting they'd been instrumental in shutting their team down. Chris and Jeff made sure to spread the praise around. They returned positive comments about each Don Bosco player who took the time to congratulate them. Chris and Jeff stopped the Bosco goalie and praised his play, hoping to keep him from feeling too down. He was an excellent goalie, and he'd played an outstanding game. Handshakes complete, the team made sure to acknowledge their fans before the trophy presentation. The fans sang the Tompkins School fight song. The players and coaches gathered at center ice, and with arms around each other's shoulders sang back as loud as they could. The final verse echoed around the garden while disappointed Don Bosco fans left the seating area. Norm Bracall, the Bears' senior captain, accepted the championship trophy from the MIA commissioner. He then handed it to Jeff and Chris, chosen by their teammates as their tournament MVPs. The defensemen thrust the trophy into the air high above their heads, showing it to their fans who'd remained quiet through the award presentation. The fans erupted in cheers again. The players waved to their fans and disappeared down the long tunnel to the showers. Jeff and Chris walked out of the dressing room together, as was their custom. They emerged onto the ice level service concourse to greet their families, who stood together. The families got to know each other well over the course of the season. Frequent family dinners together, after practices and games, helped Jeff get over himself, and he could now talk to Pauline without sounding like a fool. Pauline hugged her younger but taller brother and congratulated him. Not all that surprising. What did surprise Jeff and everyone else was when Pauline turned to Jeff, pulled him down to her by his necktie, and laid a soft, gentle, and lingering kiss on his lips. Chris and Kara's jaws dropped as they watched the kiss, and Jeff dropped his bag and sticks in shock. He'd expected a hug at most. The clatter of Jeff's sticks hitting the concrete drew looks from everyone around them. As the shock wore off, Jeff kissed Pauline back, putting his hands on her hips. She pressed her young body into him. Teammates on the bus yelled approval while they pounded on the windows. Teammates outside the bus slapped their sticks on the pavement. Other Tompkins students stood watching, surprised. Pauline and Jeff saw none of it while lost in their kiss. Pauline finally let him go. Now that your season is over and you don't have to worry about a state tournament any longer, I'm laying claim to you, she told him. Let's get out of here and find a nice place to have dinner together. Alone, okay? Um, okay, Jeff answered, still in shock. Mom, Dad, I'll be home around midnight or so, she called to her parents without taking her eyes off Jeff's. The mothers laid their hands on their respective husbands' arms and shook their heads, warning the fathers not to object. Both mothers were in on Pauline's plan for the evening. Okay, honey, her father answered, chuckling to himself. Dave now understood why Kira had been so insistent that Pauline be allowed to bring her car. Be careful, he added. Pauline grabbed the younger boy's hand and led a still-stunned Jeff towards the parking area. Her car awaited them there. Jeff's father picked up his son's bag and sticks, all the while thinking to himself that his son wouldn't lose the dreamy grin on his face for at least a month. 16th of March, 1985, Lexington, Enfield, Massachusetts. Pauline and Jeff asked the garden staff for restaurant recommendations and received many for an Italian restaurant in Lexington. The young couple spent two hours there lingering over their meal, talking. If you included the hours driving to the restaurant and home to Enfield, they talked for almost five hours. Jeff did all of the things he learned were expected of a gentleman that night, such as holding doors and chairs. Jeff also offered to pay for the meal and offered Pauline gas money, both of which she declined. Jeff's parents and sister were not up when the high schoolers returned to his house, even though this was his first date. 
Both Pauline and Jeff knew that his mother and sister would grill him the next day. He and Pauline sat talking in the kitchen for another half hour, neither wanting the night to end. Jeff walked Pauline out to her car, held the driver's door for her, and received another kiss. I had a wonderful time, Jeff, she said after the kiss finished, holding him close. Would you like to do something next weekend? He asked her once his synapses started firing again. I'd like that she answered before kissing him once again. Unfortunately, we're going away for a quick vacation now that the state tournament is over. We won't be back until the afternoon of the 24th. Figures, Jeff muttered. Pauline climbed into her car to head home. Jeff watched as she backed out of his driveway and drove away. He stood in his driveway in the cool night air and reviewed the incredible night in his mind. Jeff finally shook his head in disbelief and walked inside. Jeff walked into Tompkins nine days later. He still had a spring in his step from his night with Pauline the previous Saturday. He caught sight of Pauline at her locker and made his way over. Hi. Pauline turned and then smiled when she saw that it was Jeff. Hi. She pulled him in for another long, steamy kiss, without care at who might see them. I missed you. I missed you too. I wanted to say again that I had a great time last Saturday, he said, as they stepped back from each other. I did as well, she replied, still smiling. I'm looking forward to what this weekend may bring. Do you have something specific you'd like to do? I wouldn't mind just going to a pizza place so long as we can talk like we did Saturday. I really enjoyed that. I... Pauline stopped speaking, and her eyes widened as Jeff felt a presence behind him. Jeff brought his arm up to shield his head. He felt a fist strike his forearm. Turning and shielding Pauline with his body, Jeff saw Brian Cosgrove, the boy Jeff had the cafeteria confrontation with last year. Cosgrove, stunned that he had missed, tried smacking Jeff in the head again, but was again blocked. What's your problem, Cosgrove? Jeff asked angrily. You are, geek. It would be best if you weren't allowed to talk to girls. You should be locked in the computer room or something. Cosgrove labeled Jeff a geek early in their freshman year during study hall. Jeff had been studying instead of messing around like Cosgrove. Well, I was being polite and thanking Pauline for our date last weekend, Crepode. What did you call me, geek? Cosgrove asked, stepping closer. Crepode, Jeff responded while standing his ground. It's French for toad, you jerk. I could have called you something else, but Crepode is easy to say and there's a lady present. It also has the benefit of sounding cultured while having the word crap in it. Now, if you don't mind, I'd like to get back to discussing this coming weekend with Pauline before first period starts. Jeff turned his back to Cosgrove, dismissing and enraging him simultaneously. Jeff felt Cosgrove's hand on his shoulder, pulling to spin him around. Jeff turned and raised his left arm to block the punch he knew Cosgrove would throw. Sure enough, Cosgrove's fist was almost in his face. Jeff blocked the punch with ease and shoved him away. Cosgrove stumbled backward and then landed on his ass. Cosgrove sat stunned for a moment before picking himself up off the floor with anger visible on his face. Jeff stood his ground. He ducked back away from another punch and redirected it so that Cosgrove spun away. Jeff slid sideways to keep himself between Cosgrove and Pauline. Pauline, get a teacher! Jeff yelled. Cosgrove growled, spun around and hurled himself at Jeff again. Students crowded around. Pauline and Mr. Fenneman, an English teacher, forced their way through. Jeff focused on the 200-pound bully who charged at him like a bull. Jeff stepped aside at the last second, giving Cosgrove a firm shove as he passed. The shove caused Cosgrove to slam into the row of lockers behind Jeff with a loud crash. You come at me again and I'll drop you, Cosgrove, Jeff warned. You're gonna die, Spaz, Cosgrove yelled, seeing red. Cosgrove launched himself at Jeff yet again. Jeff let Cosgrove close with him before stepping inside Cosgrove's swing. Jeff hooked Cosgrove's arm, used the bully's momentum to pull him over his hip, and then used Cosgrove's body weight to drive him to the floor. Cosgrove landed flat on his back, knocking the wind out of him. Cosgrove lay on the floor gasping, trying to catch his breath. Mr. Fenneman moved to stand over him before hauling Cosgrove to his feet. The teacher dragged him away toward the school's office. The crowd was stunned. 
They'd always thought that Jeff was an easygoing guy up until today. No one had expected the confrontation. No one had expected anything but Jeff getting splattered by Brian Cosgrove once it started. But Jeff was untouched. Jeff turned back to Pauline to find her staring at him in shock, her eyes wide. Jeff sighed in resignation, his shoulders slumping as a sorrowful look crossed his face. He thought he had blown the chance that she took on him the previous weekend. Who would want to date a violent person like him? He walked over to the young woman he had wanted to know so much better. I'm so sorry, Pauline, Jeff said to her in a soft voice only she could hear. I won't bother you anymore. Jeff began to turn and walk away, but Pauline grabbed the front of his shirt. She pulled him back to her and planted a deep, searing kiss on his lips. She left him breathless while the crowd hooted their approval. Jeff's sorrowful look turned to shock and then to dopey by the time Pauline released him. Everyone, listen up, she yelled to the crowd. Jeff Knox is my boyfriend. Anyone who has a problem with that can get bent. I'll pick you up Friday at 6, she told him in a tone that brooked no argument. Remember, I know where you live if you even think of standing me up. Seeing Jeff's expression change from dopey to confused, Pauline explained. I've gotten to know you better since hockey season began last November, Jeff. I know I have nothing to fear from you. I know that I would never be on the receiving end of anything close to what just happened. I could also tell that you were keeping yourself between Cosgrove and me just now, protecting me. She stepped closer so she could whisper in his ear. To tell you the truth, that's got me a little hot and bothered. Expect to get a little further than first base soon. Maybe not all the way around the bases, but definitely past first. She pulled him back in for another deep kiss before sashaying away. See you at lunch. Brad Connolly walked over to stand by Jeff. Brad was a senior and someone you didn't trifle with. Together, they watched Pauline strut down the hall. Dude, Brad whispered to Jeff as they both kept their eyes on Pauline. Don't take this the wrong way, but how did you get a total babe like Pauline Miklich to go out with you? I have no idea, Brad, Jeff admitted, shrugging. She asked me. Fair enough. Brad laughed. I know we don't run with the same crowds, and you look like you can handle yourself, but my friends and I will have your back if Cosgrove or his fellow maggots try something. Jeff turned to face Brad and raised an eyebrow. Jeff, my locker is right across from Pauline's. I heard you thanking her for going out with you two weekends ago. She had clearly enjoyed herself, and that's before she laid those kisses on you. Jeff blushed. You're a lucky SOB, but from what I know of you, you deserve it. No one, no one, is going to try to take that away from you by force while I have anything to say about it. She's the only one that can take it away from you at this point. Jeff held out his hand to Brad, which the other boy took. I appreciate it, Brad. Let me know if there's anything I can ever do for you or your friends. Jeff, has anyone asked you to go to the prom with them yet? Pauline asked. They sat side by side, sharing a table in the cafeteria a week after the confrontation. You're kidding, right? No, why? Then Pauline, I might be friendly with most people in the school, but that doesn't necessarily translate into the interest in me you've shown, he said. Plus, I'm only a sophomore, so a junior or senior would have to ask me. That narrows the field a bit. Well, I'm asking you. Jeff was stunned to silence. Really? He asked in disbelief a moment later. Yes, really, she confirmed. Are you saying that you don't want to go with me? I may have my slow moments, but I try to limit my number of stupid moments. Pauline, are you really asking me if I would take you to the prom? She sucked one of his earlobes into her mouth, then dragged her teeth across it, causing him to shiver. Yes, she breathed into his ear in a sultry voice. Jeff, I've enjoyed getting to know you over the last few months and learning who you are. I'm not worried about what you might do if my wishes don't match yours. I can relax and be myself around you. Pauline, you've been honest with me, so I'll return the favor. Jeff took a deep breath and let it back out. I'm scared. Her eyes widened, but he kept talking before she could say something. I'm scared I'm going to mess this up somehow, that I'm going to do something or not do something I should have done, and I'll make you mad at me. I'm scared that tomorrow I'll wake up and this will all have been a dream, 
that I never got up the courage to talk to you last fall. I'm scared that you're going to wake up tomorrow and ask yourself what the hell you thought when you asked me out two weeks ago. Despite all that, if you're sure that you want me to take you to the prom, then the answer is of course, yes. Pauline pressed herself into him for another searing kiss. I'm sure, she answered when she released him, leaving him breathless yet again. She seemed to be good at doing that. Jeff, I feel safe with you. I know you're not all that experienced, but you have good instincts. I know we're just starting our relationship and that the other night might have seemed a little fast, but it also feels natural. Just relax. She put her head down on his shoulder and his arms came up to hold her. Pauline and Jeff parked on the side of a dark fire road in Hardwick a week later. They explored each other's bodies for close to an hour. He intended to check if Pauline still had her tonsils and ensure certain parts of her anatomy didn't have lumps. Jeff was sure the windows of Pauline's car had fogged up, but he wasn't going to stop what he was doing and check. They were so intent on their studies that they didn't notice when a Worcester County Sheriff's Department cruiser drove up. The deputy knew what was going on inside the car, based on the fogged up windows. Pauline had parked to leave more than enough room for a fire truck to pass on the fire road, so the deputy left them alone. He parked his cruiser to block the end of the fire road and watched over the car. Pauline basked in the attention Jeff paid to her. He wanted to explore below her waist, and his jeans were getting uncomfortably tight, but she laid out the rules when the night began, and he had no intention of violating her rules. Pauline leaned back to break their kisses and snuggled into Jeff's chest while he held her. She wasn't that surprised that it was almost 10 at night. She was happy that they still had two hours before she needed to drop him off at home. Jeff was amazed that he was in her back seat with his hands all over her. You have great hands, Jeff, Pauline purred. Not knowing how to respond to that comment, Jeff stroked her hair and said nothing. Shivering, Pauline sat up, leaned over the seat and started the car and turned up the heat. Jeff eyed her butt and legs while she did so, but kept his hands to himself. She dropped back onto the back seat, shooting him an apologetic glance. Sorry, she said. I shouldn't have teased you like that. Oh, I was sorely tempted, Jeff admitted. You have great legs and that skirt looks terrific on you, but you said nothing below the waist, and I wasn't about to violate your trust like that. He received a megawatt smile and a warm kiss for his honesty and willpower. She curled back up to him, and the two remained quiet while the car warmed. Jeff reminded her of their curfews. They crawled back to the front seat, and Pauline turned on the headlights. The reflective stripe and star on the side of the WCSD cruiser lit up under their glare. Jeff rolled down his window as they pulled alongside. The deputy rolled his window down also. Evening, deputy, Jeff offered. Evening to you kids as well, the man replied. Thanks for parking to keep the fire road open. That's the main reason we have to rouse people out of here at night. You'd obviously considered it, so I left you alone and blocked the road myself. How long have you been here, sir? Jeff asked. The deputy shrugged. Half hour? We appreciate you watching out for us and for not asking us to leave. The officer shrugged again. Hey, I was your age once. You kids have a good night. Thank you, sir. You as well. 26 in April 1985. Hardwick Road, Enfield, Massachusetts. The bus carrying the Tompkins School baseball team pulled back into the school gym's parking lot following their away game at Springfield Central Catholic. The game ended in a disappointing 4-3 loss. Central Catholic scored two runs in the bottom of the seventh inning, the final inning in high school baseball games. The late April weather compounded the misery of their loss. The snow had melted away a week ago, but there'd been no wind to help dry the fields at Central Catholic. The outfield was a soggy mess, and the day's low temperature and drizzle did nothing to improve that. Jeff played because their regular center fielder was out sick. Jeff's spectacular diving catch on a line drive to left center in the bottom of the sixth gave Tompkins a chance to win the game. He broke into a sprint when the ball left the bat and timed his leap just as the ball was about to pass over his left shoulder. Stretching out, he caught the ball in mid-leap and splashed down into the muddy, swampy outfield. His catch ended the sixth inning, but it went to waste an inning later. 
A miserable 30-minute ride back to Tompkins followed the game. Their driver turned the bus's air conditioner on to keep the windshield clear of all the moisture carried onto the bus by the players in their soaked uniforms. Jeff felt the epitome of cold, wet, and tired. His soaked uniform and wet underwear riding up didn't help. He kept his sneakers dry by riding in his socks, but his cleats would need the shoe stretchers and a warm oven. Jeff stepped off the bus, grabbed his bag and one of the team's equipment bags from under the bus, and limped towards the school. He noticed Pauline standing along the path halfway to the field house. Hey, he said in a weary voice. Thanks for coming out to the game. We don't get many people at away games. Of course, she replied. You look like you need a long shower. Are you offering to help? He asked before his brain caught up with his mouth. Sorry, that was pretty rude. It was. I was going to take you up on the offer, she joked. He looked stunned. Jeff, it's fine. I don't get offended that quickly, so don't worry about answering off the cuff like that. She kissed him. Go shower and change, I'm hungry. I think I'm starting to warm up, Jeff commented as they sat in a pizza parlor booth near her house an hour later. I can feel my fingers again. Should I give you something interesting to test them on? She asked while she batted her eyelashes, causing Jeff to blush. Pauline seemed bound and determined to embarrass him tonight. I should have realized this place would be busy on a Friday night, Jeff said in apology as he looked around, seeing how hard the staff was working behind the counter. This was my idea, remember? Pauline reminded him. Contrary to popular opinion, the woman in the relationship is not always right. Until the man suggests that she's not, then she is. See? You're learning, she laughed. Jeff, I wanted to spend time with you tonight, and while we're waiting, that's what we're doing. Okay, okay, he relented. You're sure about this sausage and black olive stuff? It's my favorite pizza, but there's a reason we asked them only to put olives on half of the pizza, in case I'm wrong. The couple focused on each other while they waited for their pizza, oblivious to the hooded eyes watching them from another darker booth. Jeff drummed his fingers on his thigh, trying to calm himself down while his parents drove him to Pauline's house two weeks later. Tonight was the junior-senior prom. Jeff knew all four parents would take an insane number of photos before allowing Pauline and him to leave. Jeff still couldn't believe he would escort Pauline to the dance. Reserving the tux wasn't an issue, even as late as Jeff thought he called the shop to do so. The tuxedo shop's owner laughed when Jeff asked over the phone if there was still time to reserve one. Son, the man said, it's not uncommon for some fool to waltz in here the day before their prom and expect to rent one during prom season. The owner snorted at the absurdity. A three-week notice? I've got plenty of inventory that's not spoken for, so you've still got your pick of just about anything. Jeff decided to go with basic black, as the color choice of both the tuxedo and bow tie in the end. He also chose a traditional cut to the coat when the owner told him it would go with anything. When he told Pauline of his choice, she nodded in approval and said nothing more on the subject. When they arrived at Pauline's house, Jeff got out of the car and put his jacket back on, ensuring it sat well across his shoulders. He picked up the box with Pauline's corsage and led his parents to her front door. Chris answered the doorbell. Hey, Jeff, Chris greeted. Hi, Chris, I'm sure you remember my folks. Hi, Mr. and Mrs. Knox, it's nice to see you again, Chris said, shaking their hands. Please, come on in. And Chris showed them all to the living room where his parents waited. They stood around chatting for a few minutes before Pauline made her appearance. She must have been waiting for Jeff to arrive. Good evening, Jeff she said, causing all eyes to turn to her. She wore a diaphanous blue gown that complemented her trim body and the blue in her eyes. Jeff gulped loudly enough to be heard across the room. He approached to pin on her corsage. Jeff managed to pin the orchid to her dress without sticking her or sticking himself and bleeding on her dress. It took a few attempts, but he lightly pricked his thumb only once. The parents snapped their five rolls of film before they allowed Pauline and Jeff's escape. Jeff held Pauline's car door while she slid into the driver's seat. He raced around to get in on the passenger side. 
They rode silently to the hotel. Jeff was still in shock that this was happening at all. Why do the Cosgroves hate you so much? Pauline asked Jeff as they drove away from the prom. I wish I knew, Jeff said, touching the gauze-bandaged wound on his cheek. It's getting dangerous being your boyfriend. Good thing our folks took the pictures before this happened, huh? Pauline just shook her head at the big goof. Jeremy Cosgrove had punched Jeff without warning while Jeff and Pauline danced. Jeff, blindsided by the attack, didn't hesitate to put the senior class bully down. He knocked the older Cosgrove to the dance floor, absolutely flattening Jeremy's nose with a single hard punch. The entire incident was over in seconds. Mr. Clemenceau, the head of the foreign language department and one of the chaperones for the night, saw the altercation. Mr. Clemenceau surprised Jeff by only kicking Cosgrove out of the dance, but Jeff didn't argue. The police arrested the elder Cosgrove brother and took him to the Greenwich Village Medical Center ER. Jeff figured they wouldn't have to worry about him anymore that night. You're sure you're okay? Pauline asked him once again. Really, Pauline, I'm fine, he assured her. I'm just glad I didn't get any blood on your dress. Let's go in and have some fun at the party, okay? Jeff's facial wound bled until others gave him something to cover it. The EMS crew gave him some band-aids to hold the wound closed. They called his parents to allow Jeff, a minor, to refuse ambulance transport. Okay, she said, smiling. Pauline parked not far from the house. Jeff sprang out of the car to get her door. She checked out her handsome, young sophomore date while he held the door open for her. Jeff looked so good in his classic, black tuxedo. Pauline knew her instinct to ask him out had been the right decision. Pauline giggled as Jeff held out his arm to escort her to the front door. He went out of his way to make her feel special. She felt safe and comfortable in his presence. She knew she had nothing to fear even when he found it necessary to defend himself. The people who found it necessary to test Jeff? Well, you can't cure stupid, she thought. Jeff knocked on the door to the Diebold house and waited, Pauline still on his arm. Leland Diebold opened the door. Lee was a senior this year and destined for Harvard. He dripped with money in the literal sense, but he managed to be a descent guy. Hey, Lee said, a little drunk but only a little. It's Rocky and Adrian. Jeff colored at the reference to his fights. Relax, Jeff. I know you're not out looking for trouble. He paused to waggle his eyebrows at Pauline. Not with this bonnie lass on your arm, you lucky dog, you. Now it was Pauline's turn to blush. The Cosgrove brothers both deserved what they got. Beverages are in the kitchen, guys. Have a good time. Jeff shook his hand as they entered his house. Pauline changed out of her prom dress into a simple but flattering skirt and blouse combination she brought with her. They held drinks as they sat together on a couch in Lee's living room with the other prom goers. Pauline sat on Jeff's lap. Jeff sipped his first ever alcoholic beverage. Pauline limited herself to one light drink as she would drive them home later. Both would nurse their drinks for as long as possible tonight. The others accepted Jeff's presence as a natural thing. Pauline was playfully amorous with him in public, and she looked and felt great in her new outfit. Time passed. The conversation waned as the beverages did, and the various couples began making out. Our turn, whispered Pauline, drawing Jeff into a kiss. She opened her mouth, inviting his tongue in. Minutes later, Pauline broke the kiss, stood, and pulled Jeff off the couch. Come on, she whispered leading him to a small downstairs room. She ushered him into it and locked the door behind them. I'm not ready to go all the way, Jeff, but I'm ready to go a little further than we have in the past. Jeff's fingers stroked the back of Pauline's hand. She drove and worked her car's gear shift while his hand covered hers. Jeff relaxed back into the seat with his eyes closed, still not believing what he experienced tonight. It almost made getting sucker punched worth it. Jeff couldn't see Pauline's gentle smile with his eyes closed. She knew that what he lacked in actual skill, Jeff made up for with his enthusiasm and attentiveness. Again, she knew she had made the right choice in Jeff, despite what her friends told her. Jeff, she asked in a near whisper. He opened his eyes and looked at her. Hmm? He replied. I had a really nice time tonight, Pauline told him smiling. And not because of what happened when we were alone. 
You always make me feel special, no matter where we are or what we're doing. That's the way things should be, he shrugged. But not always how things are, she reminded him. He shrugged again. As they pulled up to his house, Jeff told Pauline to park along the side of the road for an easier getaway. His winding driveway was not the easiest to negotiate when backing up, even in daylight. He told her to stay in the car owing to the late hour. Her curfew was only 30 minutes away, and it would take her half of that to drive home. Pauline grabbed his shirt and pulled Jeff in for another kiss. She let him go after a few moments, though she hadn't wanted to. I'll talk to you later this afternoon, sometime after church. Okay, he answered with another goofy grin on his face and got out of the car. He watched her leave, and then he walked up the driveway to his house. Fjord, June 1985, Hardwick Road, Enfield, Massachusetts. Pauline and Jeff enjoyed the warm weather while they ate their lunch outside Tompkins. Pauline sat wrapped in Jeff's arms under a large oak tree overlooking the playing fields. School would soon end for the summer, and only exams stood between the young couple and vacation. Besides watching some friends graduate, commencement didn't matter to either of them since they weren't yet seniors. Pauline was beginning to narrow down her college choices in advance of her senior year, while Jeff's performance on the baseball field this year had attracted notice. Their futures were taking shape, which should have made them happier. But Jeff sensed a distance in Pauline today. Pauline? She turned to look at him. What's wrong? She turned away again, a sad look on her face. It's about this summer, Jeff. Yeah, he said. I'm not looking forward to the separation. Me either. Maybe we can figure out a time for you to come to visit? I hope we can. We've both committed to jobs this summer, so that'll be tough. Plus... My family's vacation to Maine will complicate things. Pauline leaned back into Jeff but said nothing. A month later, Jeff had worked out, showered, and dressed before sitting down to breakfast on the back deck with his parents. A figure Jeff hadn't expected to see walked around the corner of the house as the Knoxes finished their meal. Pauline! he exclaimed, springing to his feet. She crashed into him in a tight embrace. This is a great surprise! Don't take this the wrong way, but what are you doing here? One of my co-workers got all touchy-feely with me by the server station at the lobster shack last night, she said with her face buried in his chest. Are you okay? Jeff asked. In a quieter voice, he asked her, Did he hurt you? I've been hanging around you too much, she laughed. I flattened his nose, kneed him in the nuts, and shoved him to the floor in front of the whole place. Every girl who works there gave me a standing ovation. It turns out that Mr. I Now Sing Soprano has put his hands on almost the entire female staff. The ones he hasn't touched are just the girls he hasn't gotten to yet. I apologized to my boss before I grabbed my purse, lit out of there, and headed back to the beach house. About an hour later, the police showed up, wanting to talk to my parents and me. Mr. Ferreira heard what happened from one of the other girls and the poor man is beside himself that such a thing happened at his place. He called the cops to have the dickhead charged with multiple counts of assault. I talked to my folks for hours before I went to bed last night, talked to mom a bit more after getting up early today, and drove here. I'm glad you did, Jeff said, leading Pauline to the small love seat that was part of the deck furniture. I know it's only been a month, but I've missed you this summer. Hearing those words, she snuggled closer to him. And I've missed you, she replied. Pauline, do you need to call your parents? To tell them you're here? Marisa Knox asked. Yeah, I probably should, she said, reluctant to let go of Jeff. Just give me your number at the Cape and I'll call them. Thanks, Mrs. K. Jeff woke with a start when he sensed a presence near his bed later that night. His eyes caught the time displayed on his alarm clock as they tried to make out who stood next to his bed. The sound of the person's voice resolved that question. Jeff? He heard Pauline whisper. Pauline, what's wrong? I just had a nightmare about the dickhead. Can I climb in with you? Of course, he replied. Grab your pillow off your bed, then come back. Yours will be much more comfortable for you than the pancake I use for mine. Just close the door before you climb into bed. 
Pauline did as Jeff suggested, and then returned. With both of them lying on their left sides, they spooned together and snuggled under the covers to stay warm in the breeze from the fan. This is nice, Jeff heard Pauline whisper. Smiling, he kissed her ear before settling in to go back to sleep. Oh my, Pauline muttered as she rolled onto her back next to Jeff the following afternoon. They'd just taken their relationship to the next level while the rest of the Knox family was in Springfield, shopping. Jeff, you were incredible. Really, that was okay? Jeff asked her. No, it wasn't okay, Jeff. She snarked to him, his face falling a bit. That was frickin' mind-blowing. Crap. I thought my head was going to explode. Oh, he answered. I was worried for a second. Don't be, she assured him. You're a natural. She sat up and pulled Jeff out of bed after snuggling with him for a few more minutes. I know your family's going to be another few hours, so let's try showering with your partner. Open your window to air this place out while we're in the bathroom. I'm really not looking forward to you going back to the Cape now. I'll make sure I come back as often as I can, don't you worry. The late summer sun beat down on the fields at Tompkins while the fall sports teams prepared for their seasons. Jeff closed his eyes and took a deep breath while smelling the fresh cut grass and feeling the sun's warmth on his face. Some found double sessions stressful, but he didn't. Jeff reveled in the competition in pushing his body to its limit and feeling it respond. Out here, he remade himself two years ago, casting aside the old him. Gone forever was the shy, timid boy he'd once been. How come coach didn't ask me to run this part of practice instead of a junior? Sneered Garrett Humphreys for about the tenth time that day, shattering Jeff's sense of peace. I've played on a state championship team. The whole team was tired of hearing how the new guy played on a championship soccer team at his old school north of New York City. The team could point to half a dozen members who also played hockey at Tompkins and won a state championship less than six months ago if they cared to. They didn't. Uh Jeff rolled his eyes at some of his other teammates before finishing the current drill. Once finished, Jeff caught everyone else's attention while ensuring Garrett didn't see the running motions he made. He grabbed his coach's attention too, while making the same running motions. Jeff also opened and closed his hand like someone running their mouth while chucking his head toward Humphreys. Coach Romanov nodded. He was sick of hearing about the championship team too. Guys? Jeff addressed the group. I'm worried about our conditioning going into this season. Mock groans from the experienced players filled the air. Humphreys and the freshmen looked confused. They wouldn't be for long. Let's go was all Jeff said before he took off running, the other veteran midfielders falling in behind him. The new players scrambled to keep up. While he didn't set a blistering pace, Jeff set one faster than the jog midfielders used most often when moving around the field. It seemed to the newbies as if Jeff would never stop running. Jeff kept the group running for the rest of the morning's practice session before cutting them loose at lunch. He used the opportunity to corral the freshmen and speak to them while watching the rest of the team head for the locker room. Humphreys had left the group to go collapse in the shade. Guys, a midfield succeeds or fails on its endurance. Some of you need a bit more work on your running. Some of you already look like you're where we need you to be, but you all did well for this early in the season. For today, rest up and eat slowly during lunch. Hydrata, hydrate, hydrate, no soda. Coach wants us back here at one o'clock. Tom Jarrett, now a senior, came up to Jeff as they headed back to the locker room. How much of that was to shut that guy up? Tom asked him in a low voice. There was a sly smile on his face. Yeah, that was kind of petty of me, Jeff admitted. The prick deserved it, Tom said with feeling. From what I've heard, that guy didn't get much playing time at his old school last year. He'd be more accurate if he told people he collected splinters in his ass watching his team win. Tom paused to let that sink in. And now you also know that these frosh can hang with us deeper into a game than most freshmen can at this point in the season. Plus, you're protecting the new guys from that jerk. He can't shoot his mouth off if he's sucking wind, Tom pointed out, clapping his younger friend on the back. He thinks he should be a leader because he's a senior. Jeff, you're more captain material now as a junior than he'll ever be. 
You've proven since your freshman year that you've got what it takes, on and off the field. I'm sorry you're not feeling well, babe, Joe Knox said to Marissa, rubbing her back while they walked back into the house. Joe and Marissa had tried to take advantage of the beautiful mid-September day and head to Amherst. The kids were doing their own things this Saturday. Before she and Joe got to the college town, a stomach bug reared its ugly head, and Marisa started throwing up along the side of Route 160 in Pelham. I'm sorry I ruined our day out together, Joe. Marissa apologized, her color still pale. It's not your fault, babe, Joe assured her. Why don't you head upstairs and lie down? Thanks, hon. Marisa turned and trudged up the stairs. As Marissa passed Jeff's room, she thought she heard laughter. That's weird, Marisa thought. I figured Pauline and Jeff would still be out. She opened his door while knocking on it. Jeff, she called. She heard gasps and frantic movements. She gasped herself when she saw a flash of Pauline's naked back as the young woman ducked under the covers. A red-faced Jeff reclined on the bed. Thank heavens that he was under the covers, too. Clothes from both teenagers lay strewn across his normally neat room. Oh, Marisa exclaimed as realization hit her. I'm sorry, guys. Get dressed, and then come down to the living room to see Joe and me. Marissa backed out of the room, shutting the door behind her. Son of a... Jeff whispered, looking up at the ceiling. I'm sorry, Pauline, he said to his girlfriend as she peeked out from under the covers. I thought they'd be gone all afternoon. Me too, she said. Still, bad news doesn't get better with age, Pauline said, while she climbed out of bed to get redressed. Jeff admired her nude body and wondered if it would be the last time he'd get to see it. You'd best get cleaned up and get dressed, she said. I'll wait here. I thought you were going to lie down, Joe asked his wife, confusion settling over his features. Joe, I think I just walked in on Pauline and Jeff having sex, Marisa said as she settled onto the couch next to her husband. Joe rubbed his hands over his face. Oh man, he whispered, casting his eyes at the ceiling. I was hoping we'd have a little more time before we got to this point. Yeah, at least they're being responsible about it. I think I saw a box of condoms on Jeff's nightstand. Thank heavens for small favors, Joe sighed. I guess we'll have to tell Dave and Kyra, meaning Pauline's parents. Definitely, but let's see what the kids have to say first. Pauline and Jeff came down the stairs hand in hand. They managed to look unashamed of what they'd been doing while not coming off as defiant. They sat side by side together on the couch and looked at Jeff's parents, waiting for them to say something. Guys, first of all, I'm sorry I walked in on you like that, Marisa said. Mrs. K, it was bound to happen, honestly, Pauline replied. It was just bad luck. I am glad that you two were at least being responsible, Marisa said. I saw the box of condoms on Jeff's nightstand. Plus, I'm on the pill, Mrs. K. We aren't taking chances here. Pauline, you understand that we have to tell your mom and dad? Joe asked. We can't exactly keep this a secret. Not to be flipped, Dad, but we should call them now, Jeff said. You guys know, so Mr. and Mrs. Micklitch should know as soon as possible. You seem remarkably calm about the prospect of Pauline's parents learning about this, Marissa said. Are you kidding, Mom? Jeff asked. Excuse my language, but there are skid marks on my shorts just thinking about the prospect. It's not like we can keep you two from seeing each other, Jeff, his father pointed out. You go to the same school. Of all of the irresponsible things to do, Kira Miklich cried to her daughter as she and Dave talked with Pauline in their living room. Talked was being generous because Kira had ranted for 20 minutes. Chris made himself scarce long before Pauline returned at his father's suggestion. You're right, Mom, it was irresponsible, Pauline admitted, hoping to slow her mother down. We should have made sure Jeff's door had a lock. That didn't do it. Don't take that tone with me, young lady. Kira. Dave broke in, casting a look at his wife. Kira swallowed what she'd been about to say and crossed her arms. She harumphed and leaned back on the couch. Mom, Dad, Jeff and I are being as careful as we can be. Pauline explained to her parents now that she was able to get a word in. 
There's protection on both sides. We know that's not a guarantee, so we add the rhythm method on top of both. It's not statistically zero, but the risk is as close to zero as we can get it. That's it. You're not to see him anymore, Kira declared, having caught her second wind. Pauline fixed her mother with a withering gaze. Don't even think that again, mother, she said in a voice that dripped ice. Jeff's a nearly straight-A student, a three-sport athlete, is almost universally liked by every clique there is at school. And he's worked a job for over two years where he's earned raise after raise because of his performance. On top of all of that, he manages to spend time with me and treats me like gold. Would you like me to continue? Pauline crossed her arms as she continued to stare her mother down. Pauline, Dave said in the same conciliatory tone he used before. We're just worried that something could happen and derail all of your plans. As much as I like Jeff, and you know I do, you're our daughter first. Pauline sighed and answered her father in a much calmer tone. Dad, I know. I know that you guys have warned Chris and me about what can happen, and that you have first-hand experience in seeing it happen to other families. As Mr. Knox pointed out, Jeff and I go to the same school. Are you going to pull me out of there and send me to Palmer High? Her mother sighed, the angry look fading away. No she admitted. Tompkins is where you and your brother both need to be. Jeff and I have slightly less than one year left together, and that's barring some catastrophe. I'm headed somewhere for college at the end of next summer. He'll just be starting his senior year at Tompkins. All I'm asking for is that year. No special treatment. No changes to the rules beyond what you might think are reasonable as I grow up. That's all, Mom. Kira looked over at her husband, who gave her an almost imperceptible nod. Okay, honey, Kira said in a much quieter voice. I'm sorry I yelled at you. Me too, Mom, Pauline offered. She stood up to hug her mother. I'll go start my homework now. Call me before dinner time? Okay, honey, her father said, also hugging her while kissing the top of her head. Love you. Love you guys too. Pauline called over her shoulder as she left the room. Well, that ended better than it started, Dave said to his wife as they sat back on the couch. He threw an arm around her shoulders. Kyra sighed again. I hate that she's growing up. I was changing her diapers just yesterday. I know, honey, Dave chuckled. Our parents probably said the same thing. Honestly, though, have you ever seen her this happy? You mean when I'm not yelling at her? Dave laughed louder. You weren't yelling, Kira. You were surprised by the situation and concerned for our daughter's welfare. Now Kira laughed. Are you planning on running for office? In all seriousness, that was a well-thought-out argument she presented. Yeah, her parents didn't raise no dummy. Kira swatted at Dave as he added, So we let them keep on keeping on? Kira cast her eyes at the ceiling. God help me, but yes. I don't see how we could do anything else. Trying to keep them apart wouldn't end well. We should call Joe and Marisa a little later. I would imagine that there's a very similar conversation going on over on Westware Road. Your parents actually said that to my parents? Jeff asked, shocked. After the way the discussion started at your place? He held Pauline in his arms as they leaned against his locker at Tompkins two days later. Kind of shocking, isn't it? Only slightly less than four million volts would be. <laughs> You're always telling me that it's not the voltage you have to worry about, but the current. Shut up, kid. Come on, Officer Obi. Pauline laughed as she straightened up. It's time to get to homeroom. Jeff and Pauline continued their line of conversation the next time they saw each other, which was at lunch. So how do we approach this year? Jeff asked. As you said, you'll be off to college next August. The same way we've approached our whole relationship, Jeff. We take it as it comes, talk about things, help each other where we can. We can fill in the details later. I should probably quit my job at Bilzerian's after graduation so I can spend more time with you. No. No, I'm not sure that's the right decision at all. Why not? Well, she paused to gather her thoughts. All right, let's look at it from this angle. Do we spend every waking moment together? No, I guess we don't, Jeff admitted. Right. While we're together, we each also have things that we do separately, 
right? Yeah, I guess I see what you're saying. Mom doesn't work at the garage fixing the same car as Dad. They have lives together at home, but each is still their own person. Exactly. I think that's how we should approach next year, specifically next summer. Okay. Point taken. So what were you and Pauline talking about at lunch? Why do you need to plan out the year in September? Kathy asked Jeff later as they walked to their French IV class. Jeff now took French a four and Spanish a four, having placed out of French the three. Well, since she's a senior this year, she'll be at college next year, right? Right. So she's trying to keep me from putting too much pressure on myself. There's an end in sight with our relationship, but I don't need to stress over it. Yep. Why does there have to be an end? Why not continue it next year? First, it'll be a long-distance relationship no matter where she goes. Second, wherever she winds up, I'll have no frame of reference for the things she experiences. Third, it'll happen if it's supposed to. You're too grown up. Tell me about it. Hey guys, Jeff said in greeting to his friends as he sat down to lunch the following day. Their table's cast of characters didn't change much from day to day. He and Pauline, Kathy and Jack, Tom and his girlfriend, Connie. The only frequent change was the near constant rotation of teammates he and Tom played with, who often filled out the table. Today a new addition sat next to Kathy. Hey Jeff, Jeff, I'd like you to meet Allison Newberry. She's a junior like us. Hi Allison, I'm Jeff Knox. Welcome to our little slice of heaven. Did you already meet Pauline, my girlfriend? Allison nodded that she had. What brings you to the picturesque Swift River Valley more halfway through high school? Allison giggled. Dad works for the Air Force as a civilian logistics specialist. He recently transferred to Westover, and we now live in New Salem. Westover Air Force Base in Chicopee lay just north of Springfield. The transport unit there is switching to a larger type of cargo plane sometime soon, and the Air Force wants Dad to help facilitate the transition. We've only been here about a month, and both Mom and Dad are already talking about not ever leaving. Jeff raised his eyebrows. Wow, Westover's what, an hour from here? New Salem's a pretty town and you're very welcome here, but that's still a powerful long drive. Dad said it's worth it for us to live in this area and for me to be able to come to school here, Allison explained. He wants any math and science classes to challenge me. Why's that? I'm planning to be a cosmologist or an astrophysicist. What's that? Jeff asked. I know you didn't say cosmetologist. Cosmologist, she repeated. Someone who studies the origins of the universe. An astrophysicist does the same with the actual stars. Oh, so light Saturday reading type of stuff? Allison laughed. You should have scored on that one, Jeff told Tom as they backed up to receive the goalie's punt. <laughs> yeah, well, a low hard shot might not have been the best choice on a day like this, Tom replied. I was trying to make the ball skip across that puddle like a stone across a pond. A low, heavy overcast hung over the valley on this late September day, obscuring the hilltops surrounding Tompkins. Just after lunch, the skies had opened up, and the deluge soaked the ground. Soccer was an almost all-weather sport, so the game went on as scheduled. Tom's shot on a near-empty net splashed through a puddle of standing water in front of the opposing goal before stopping dead on the wet, sodden soccer pitch. Their opponent's goalie, caught out of position, only had to walk over and pick the ball off the turf. At least this is a home game. We don't have a bus ride ahead of us like that one from Central Catholic last year. No. Jeff stared at his friend while rainwater dripped off his nose. Stop trying to cheer me up, okay? So, new girl? How about a date? No, I don't think so. Allison responded, putting her books in her locker. The quicker she got that done, the faster she could get away from this boy. He seemed like bad news to her. Two months into the school year and he hasn't bothered to learn my name, she thought. Yeah. Oh, I think you want to go out with me, the boy said in a gentle yet menacing voice. He pushed the top section of Allison's locker closed as he gave her his unsolicited opinion. It closed with a soft. Now Allison was scared, not just annoyed. As the boy advanced and forced her to back away, he stiffened, cocked his head to his right and gurgled. Are we making this an annual occurrence, Cosgrove? Jeff whispered into the bully's right ear as he stood behind him. Jeff saw Cosgrove crowding Allison by her locker 
as he walked down the hall with Pauline. He came up behind Cosgrove and pushed a thumb into the pressure point just above the inside of Cosgrove's left elbow. His other thumb dug into a pressure point behind the end of Cosgrove's jaw on the right side of his face. Either was enough to gain compliance through the pain they generated. The pain from both was crippling. Are you okay, Allison? Jeff asked as he held the pressure on those spots. He pushed Cosgrove into the lockers. I'm okay, Jeff, thank you. I'm glad, Jeff said as he gave her a gentle smile. That smile contrasted with the pain he inflicted on the boy who had bothered Allison. Why don't you go join Pauline, and I'll be with you ladies in a moment. She answered with a quick nod. Jeff's expression changed when he turned his attention back to the bane of his existence. Gone was the friendly face he showed Allison, and in its place was one that was well past pissed off. I've told you over and over to leave people alone, dickhead, Jeff whispered. That's your name now as far as I'm concerned. Dickhead with a capital D. Here's a subject we haven't yet discussed. No means no. Jeff punctuated his point on the word no by pulling Cosgrove off the lockers, then shoving him back against them with a resounding crash. Jeff kept the pressure on. Does that noise sound familiar? Remind you of last year? Jeff repeated the maneuver, causing the lockers to rattle again. I swear to God you piss me off like no one else. Does it come naturally, or do you make an effort to be that way? Tell you what, I'm going to let go now, and you're going to pick up your books and just walk away, okay? Jeff released Cosgrove and took a big step back in case the bully tried something. Sure enough, Cosgrove spun around with murder in his eyes. Jeff had enough. He slammed Cosgrove back against the lockers with his hand around the bully's neck. That hand connected to an iron bar that doubled as Jeff's arm. Jeff applied just enough pressure to Cosgrove's throat to prevent him from swallowing. Cosgrove's eyes bulged as he tried pulling at Jeff's arm without success. I recommend that you don't even try whatever you're considering. I will put you on the ground faster than your brother at prom last year. How's his nose, by the way? Is it still spread across his face? Listen very closely. Your third strike with me came when you took a run at me last March. You're living on borrowed time, and that time is rapidly running out. It may run out here at Tompkins, or you might make it to graduation and get out of here in one piece. I may be the one to punch your ticket, or that opportunity may fall to someone else some other day. I don't care. He let go of Cosgrove again. The other boy's eyes were wide as Jeff stepped back. Jeff kept his eyes on Cosgrove while he turned back to Pauline and a wide-eyed Allison. He took a few steps before he looked away. Jeff took loud breaths in through his nose and blew them out through his mouth. Are you done playing now? Pauline asked with a grin, trying to lighten Jeff's mood. He just growled at her, closing his eyes while still trying to calm himself. He took more slow, deep breaths as he placed his arm around his girlfriend. I'm sorry you had to see me like that, Allison, Jeff said, his eyes reopening after he calmed down. You don't like him, do you? Allison asked. That's a very long story, Jeff replied. Well, I guess you showed him. Quadrat demonstrandum. Do they do that a lot? Allison asked Pauline while they walked to math class. Allison was a year ahead of most juniors in that subject and took calculus with the seniors. Who? Jeff and Cosgrove? Pauline asked in reply. Allison nodded. I guess they've been at each other's throats since the first day of their freshman year. Cosgrove was harassing Jack, and Jeff called him on it. They seem to have a go at each other a few times a year. Oh. Pauline stopped in the middle of the hall, placing a hand on Allison's arm so that she'd stop as well. Allison, you have to understand Jeff is only like that with people who threaten him or his friends. He does that for his friends, not to his friends. Other kids bullied Jeff pretty badly when he was at the public middle school here in Enfield. After his eighth grade year, Jeff decided that Tompkins was going to be a new start for him, so he started making his own choices. Working out was one. Making an effort to talk to people was another. Not taking crap from others, especially bullies, was yet another. Pauline started walking towards their class again with Allison alongside her. 
Last year, after my brother and Jeff started playing hockey together, Chris introduced us. That poor boy back there blushed bright red and stammered so hard I thought he'd bite off his tongue. Over the hockey season, I got to know Jeff. He's sweet, funny, and a true gentleman. After the two of them helped bring the school a state hockey championship, I grabbed Jeff in full view of our families, their teammates and others, and laid a kiss on him. He was so shocked he dropped what he was carrying. When we got back to school from spring vacation, Cosgrove tried to smack him in the head while Jeff and I talked at my locker. Jeff handled it, but thought he had scared me away. I think he probably hates Cosgrove for that alone. Jeff apologized to me and started to walk away. He looked like someone had just stolen everything from him. I showed him he was wrong, and we've been together ever since. Pauline sighed. Allison, I'll tell you something in confidence before we get to calculus. I'm not going to be here next year and you know that. But Jeff will be lost, no matter how much he prepares. He's like that. It won't be easy for me either, but I think I'll recover faster than he will. I think you two would be good together, even though I've only known you a couple of months. Wait, what? You and Jeff, I think you'd make a good couple. No way, Allison protested. I'm not good enough for him, not after he's dated someone like you. I mean, look at you. I'm nowhere near as pretty as you, for starters. Pauline stopped again and raised an eyebrow. You want to try that again, Miss Newbury? You blow me away academically. You get his humor, which is no mean feat by itself. We help you a little with your hair and stuff, and you'll knock people's socks off. If this is something you want, truly want, I will help put you in a position to make it happen. Allison considered the older girl's words for many moments. You know, I think I do, she said. Well, so much for playoffs, remarked Tom Jarrett. He and Jeff sat on their home pitch, watching Greenfield High School celebrate their win. Fifth-seeded GHS just eliminated the fourth-seeded Tompkins team in the first round of the Western Mass Division II soccer tournament. The bright side being that you can hang out with Connie until baseball starts, Jeff pointed out. Constance, Connie Basilla, had been Tom's girlfriend since the start of the year. Tom didn't play hockey. There's that, Tom admitted. Come on, we've got to get these guys in line to shake hands. Jeff looked up and down the street to see if anyone followed him. Snorting at his silliness, Jeff opened the door to the office he came to enter. Good morning, young man, a huge individual in a Marine Corps uniform said. He came over to shake Jeff's hand. Jeff's hand disappeared in his. How can I help you? Uh, actually, Sergeant, I came to speak to an Army recruiter. Certainly, Sergeant Williams can help you out with that. The Marine indicated another man rising from a different desk. If you have any questions about the United States Marine Corps, you come on back over. Thank you, Sergeant. Good morning, I'm Sergeant Bill Williams. I understand you have some questions about the Army. Yes, Sergeant, Jeff answered, nodding. Um, William Williams? Yeah, my parents had an interesting sense of humor, the sergeant laughed. Come on over to my desk and I'll answer any questions you might have. Jeff talked to Sergeant Williams for almost 45 minutes. Sergeant Williams gave Jeff a few pamphlets to look over and promised not to call his house yet. Jeff gasped when the pain hit him. He rolled onto his back and grabbed at his foot but his skate was in the way. That was a good thing or he'd have injured it more. The trainers shuffled across the ice, helped along by his teammates. Jeff, Jeff, what happened? Stephanie Birch, the head athletic trainer, asked him. He couldn't see her face clearly while his eyes watered from the pain. Slap shot to the foot, he told her through gritted teeth. Jeff tried to block a shot by laying down on the ice between the shooter and the goal. He was successful in blocking it, but it was a Pyrrhic victory for him. Does anything else hurt? That's not enough? Steph laughed a short laugh. Well, your sense of humor's not broken, she said. Let's get you off the ice and see about your foot. Chris Micklich and Barry Silvers, one of this year's freshmen, helped Jeff to his feet. They supported him under the arms as all three slowly skated off the ice. Passing through the boards, Jeff noticed that Pauline and Kara were already there at ice level, having been watching from the bleachers. 
Kiddo, can you get mom? He asked Kara. They'll likely want me to go to the hospital. She nodded and disappeared. Steph, is it okay if Pauline sits in the training room? Jeff turned and asked Pauline, that's if you want to. Both women nodded and Pauline fell in behind the three hockey players. Steph cut his laces to minimize the pain before she worked his skate off. Once Jeff's sock also came off, everyone could see the purplish red and silvery bruise on his left instep. The bruise indicated a fracture to one or more of the bones there. Well, if my guess is correct, Jeff, your season is over unless we reach the playoffs, Steph said in apology. Jeff lay down on the training table. Man, he sighed as he rubbed his face. He felt Pauline kiss him on the forehead. At least he guessed it was Pauline and not Steph since there were no sounds of a cat fight. Jeff, his mother's voice called. In here, Mrs. Knox, Steph answered while waving Marisa and Kara into the room. Marisa took in the sight of Jeff's elevated foot with an ice pack on it. Well, at least it's been a while since you've gotten hurt playing sports. Yeah, he agreed, still reclined on the table. Just take me down to Dad's shop and put my foot in the frame straightener. I'll be fine. The three women in the room laughed at his joke. When Coach Kessler entered and Steph gave him the news, he did not. I'll run Jeff over to GVMC and get this x-rayed, Mrs. Knox, Steph said. We have an agreement with their sports medicine department and ER, so he'll be back here in about 30 to 45 minutes. You don't need me for permission or anything? No, Marissa. It's all part of the sports waiver you sign at the beginning of each school year, Coach Kessler explained. The coach, or his designee, can handle that in cases like these. Steph is my designee for this. Okay, John, thanks. Kara, do you want to stay, go home, what? I might as well go home, Mom, Kara said. I'm sure Pauline will want to go with Jeff. If it's allowed? Pauline asked while nodding, indicating she'd like to go with Jeff. So you are done for the season? Pauline asked while Jeff settled into his seat at the lunch table. Unless by some miracle we make the playoffs, Jeff said, laying his crutches on the floor. The official report came from sports medicine yesterday. It had taken three weeks to get it, however. With Jeff unavailable, coach paired Chris with Paul Benton, who, even as a senior, wasn't ready for the bright lights. Tompkins was well off last year's pace without a solid defense to compensate for this year's lack of offense. They'd been eliminated from the playoffs three days ago. What about baseball? I should be ready. I'll get the cast off about the beginning of March, and I can begin rehab right after that. It'll be kind of tight, but I should be ready before the season starts. The textbook seems a bit simplistic in its explanations, Mr. Tugas, Jeff pointed out to his history teacher. Between you and I, Jeff, you're right. I must teach to the approved textbook, however. For my paper, may I investigate site and use the other causes in my arguments? Of course, Jeff. However, while you are reaching for big rewards with this strategy, you are aware of what comes with the attempt, correct? Big risk, sir, I understand. Jeff felt only a slight twinge when his left foot struck the pavement. His walking cast had only been off for a week, he flexed and extended the foot whenever possible, trying to regain the range of motion in his left ankle. Jeff's lower leg muscles had atrophied under the cast, and he didn't have too long to regain strength there. Jeff took his first post-cast run on the track at Tompkins, partially out of a concern for safety and for the convenience. His stamina had slipped a bit while unable to run, but the parts of his workout he could do without his foot kept the loss negligible. His foot felt fine, but the growing ache in his left ankle threatened to end his run before anything else. After three miles, the ache was noticeable, as well as the slight limp it produced. He limped to Coach Kessler's office. Kessler looked up from his paperwork when Jeff entered. How'd it go? His coach asked. Stamina-wise, it went fine. The flexibility in my left ankle still needs work. Running three miles hurt, and I've got a little limp now. We'll see how I feel later. Let me know tomorrow morning? Sure thing, coach. Jeff sprinted across center field, tracking the line drive. The ache in his left ankle he noticed a week ago was barely there as he ran. There were no abnormal feelings from his instep at all. The ball reached the top of its arc and dipped towards the grass. 
Jeff launched himself forward, reaching out as he spread the wide, deep maw of his outfielder's mitt, open to snare the ball just above the turf. He smelled freshly cut grass when he slid across the outfield. Didn't look like he had any issue with that, one of the spectators said to the man with him. Nope, the other man responded. The next batter also stroked a line drive into center field. This ball flew lower. It bounced off the turf in short center once. Before it could bounce again, Jeff scooped it up on a dead run. He fired the ball to first base. The ball's laces spun through the air with an audible sizzle. The first baseman was ready. He stretched for the throw, which beat the stunned batter by a full step. Damn, the man whispered. Yep, his partner responded. Jeff jogged in from center when the top half of the first inning ended. How's the ankle? Coach Kessler asked. Feels great, Jeff assured him. Kessler nodded. The first three hitters for Tompkins reached base. It was up to Jeff as the cleanup hitter to drive in runs. He dug in and stared at the pitcher. The pitcher, hoping to get ahead in the count, tried an outside curve. It didn't break much tracking the middle of the plate. Jeff pounced on it, slamming it deep to left field. The pitcher almost gave himself whiplash watching it go. The ball bounced onto the parking lot beyond the left field fence, though Jeff didn't break any windshields with his home run. Jeff sprinted halfway to first before the ball cleared the wall. He was mobbed at home plate by three base runners who scored on his hit. Runs, throws, catches, and hits for power. Only one more to go, said the man in the bleachers. Yep. Two innings later, with Tompkins up 5-1, to one, Jeff came to the plate again with one man on second. He stared out at the same pitcher he faced in the first inning. The pitcher missed his spot again. The ball arrived just inside the outside corner when the catcher had asked for it off the plate. Jeff hit what he was given. He punched it into the opposite field for a single, bringing in another run. And he hits for average. All five tools. Yep. Two hours later, the men drove back to their hotel in their rental car. They called their boss once they returned to their room. I'm telling you, Bob, if the kid can be consistent, then he's the real deal, the first man said to his boss at the other end. Four for four with a grand slam, two doubles, a single, and seven RBIs. He threw a guy out at first from center, a diving catch on another play. No issues we could see with that ankle either. Yep agreed the second man from a chair nearby. The first man listened to the voice on the phone for a moment. Well, make your decision quickly, because we saw at least four other teams scouting this kid. So you're all set for this weekend? Pauline asked, wrapped in Jeff's arms as they ate lunch. They sat under their favorite tree overlooking the Tompkins playing fields. Yep, Jeff confirmed. I picked up the tux this past weekend, and I've already checked the fit. I'm picking up your corsage at the florists on Saturday morning, and then I'll be by to pick you up at six. It was prom once again for the couple, their second together. It also marked the closing days of Pauline's senior year. She'd be off to UMass Amherst at the end of the summer. The couple agreed they would enjoy what time they had left together and would part as friends. Pauline could feel a tension within Jeff today, despite his calm exterior. Jeff? Is something wrong? He hugged her a little tighter. Never anything wrong around you, babe. She smacked his arm at the flippant reply. Jeff, I'm serious. I can tell that there's something wrong. Jeff sighed. It's not about us, Pauline. Not directly. It's about what I'm going to do after my senior year next year. You're going to college on a baseball scholarship, right? I mean, aren't you? She asked, confused. Despite the baseball team's lackluster performance this year, his performance had caused the scouts to circle. I don't know, Pauline. Jeff sighed again. I'm not entirely certain that I'm ready to go to college. Plus, I need to do something else, something more worthwhile than just going to school and playing baseball. Jeff paused. I think I might join the army. What? She hissed, stunned. The army? When did you decide that? Just recently. Jeff answered. It's becoming something I feel like I need to do for myself. I don't want to go to college just because I'm expected to. With a 3.8-ish GPA, college was definitely something people expected Jeff to do. Have you told your parents? As the saying goes, 
I may be crazy, but I ain't stupid. I know I have to tell them eventually, but I need a bit more info first. I'm not ready just yet. Towards August 1986, West Ware Road, Enfield, Massachusetts, Jeff and Pauline sat at the breakfast table, each lost in their thoughts while they ate. Today was the day that they would say goodbye to each other and end their relationship of 18 months. Neither was under the impression that the goodbye would be easy. They held each other's hand, desperate to maintain contact. They were willing to struggle through eating one-handed to do so. Pauline's new environment at college would bring new opportunities and experiences. Jeff would share in none of those things since he would be a high school senior. They agreed to remain friends, but neither took any comfort in that today. Marisa watched the young couple with sorrow. She was amazed that she allowed Pauline to sleep over for the couple's final night together. Marisa knew full well what happened behind Jeff's door last night. All four parents admitted that the couple was being mature and thoughtful about the impending separation. Their request wasn't that outrageous. Pauline had been good for Jeff, a good first girlfriend. And good first, well, other experience. No parent wanted to think about that part of their child's development, but she admitted that they handled being caught in flagrante delicto last year with maturity. Marisa worried about how her son would handle the coming days. Breakfast ended all too soon. Pauline gathered her things because it was time for her to head home. She said goodbye to the rest of the Knox family before Jeff walked her out to her car. His family remained inside to give the teenage lovers some privacy. Once at her car, Pauline embraced Jeff and began sobbing. Jeff couldn't keep a dry eye himself. They held their embrace for some time before either spoke. Thank you, Pauline, Jeff whispered. Thank you for letting me be your boyfriend. Thank you for giving me a chance. Thank you, Jeff, she sniffed. Thank you for making my choice last year seem like a complete no-brainer. This past year and a half has been the best I ever could have imagined. I'll compare how anyone else treats me from now on to how you treated me. Don't become a hermit this year, okay? Have some fun. It's your senior year. She paused, the old familiar twinkle of mischief returning to her sad eyes. Don't forget, I've got a very loyal spy in the class of 1988 watching you. He had to chuckle. Don't hit my sister up for too much information. He grinned, despite the pain of impending loss. Pauline nodded, and her demeanor changed back to serious. Be well, Jeff. I'll never forget you. Be well, Pauline. The two kissed one last time. When the kiss ended, tears streaked down Pauline's face as she got into her car. Jeff forced back his own tears. Pauline backed her car down the driveway, with Jeff following it as she did so. He watched her drive away with a hole in his heart. Jeff stood looking after her for long after she was out of sight. He turned when he felt his mother's hand on his arm. Jeff, are you going to be okay? She asked. Eventually, Mom, he said, turning back to face the street. I'm going to change and go for a run. Maybe channel these emotions into something useful today. He made his way back to the house to get ready. Jeff pushed himself hard during his run, trying to drive his sorrow away through force of effort. It didn't work. His emotions broke through the wall he tried to build with hard running. Jeff sat down on the edge of a lawn, hiding his face in his hands. Grief tore his heart out through his throat. He'd barely gotten himself under control when he heard a familiar voice. Jeff? Turning, Jeff recognized Charlene Flaherty, or Charlie as she preferred. She was in his sister's class and a fellow three-sport athlete. Excuse me, but are you okay? Hi, Charlie. Not really. No, not okay. Jeff, what's wrong? Just trying to deal with some stuff, Charlie. It kind of got the best of me, he explained. Pauline and I said goodbye to each other about two hours ago. He looked around to see where he was, now that his head was clearer. Oh, I hadn't noticed that I stopped in front of your house. Ignoring his comment about her house, Charlie sat down next to him and asked, She's starting college soon, I gather. Jeff nodded. She moves into her dorm at UMass tomorrow. I knew this was going to be tough, but I wasn't ready for how much it hurts right now. Time heals all wounds, Jeff, and you just said you've only had about two hours to let the healing begin. It'll get better, 
even if it doesn't feel that way right now. I know you're right, Charlie, but my heart doesn't agree. Jeff stood up, wobbling. Whoa, I guess I pushed a little too hard. If I give you my phone number, would you mind calling my house? Tell my family that I'm walking home from here so they don't get worried. Of course, she said, hugging him while giving him a sympathetic smile. Keep your head up, Jeff. You're one of the good guys, and I think more than a few girls will be letting you know what they think of you this year. Thanks, Charlie, he said, giving her another weak smile in return. I'll see you tomorrow for the start of this year's double session fun. He gave her a little wave and started towards home. Charlie watched him walk off, hoping that she had given him some measure of comfort because he was a good guy. Chris Miklich collapsed onto the grass at the end of the run. The midfielders had just run Indian runs. While players jog around the outside boundaries of the soccer field, the last runner sprints for the front of the line, weaving between the others as they run. One run is brutal, but they ran three. Chris didn't mind working hard before the season, but Jeff would work them to death at this pace. The rest of the morning practice session was more of the same. Jeff ran the breakout portions for the midfielders with an intensity Chris had never seen before. He knew the end of Jeff's relationship with Pauline was behind this behavior. Chris tried to talk to Jeff about how he was doing on Monday, but Jeff rebuffed him. A full week of this intensity would burn out the midfield before the season even started. Coach? Chris called from the doorway to his coach's office. Peter Romanoff looked up from his lunch and waved Chris in. Chris shut the door and sat down in front of his desk. What's up, Chris? Sir, it's Jeff. Jeff, what's going on? He's gonna work us to death, coach, Chris warned. You know I don't mind hard work, but this is, well, I don't know what this is. What do you think the problem is? The coach asked. He's been dating my sister for a year and a half, Chris said. She started at UMass on Monday, and they broke up the day before. They planned the breakup a while ago, but it's bothering him more than I expected. Obviously more than he expected, too. Coach Romanov nodded. I'll watch him this afternoon and speak to him. Thanks, Coach, Chris said as he rose. Peter Romanov kept his eyes on Jeff as the afternoon progressed. He noticed what Chris talked about right away and modified his plan for the afternoon session to keep the team practicing together. He called Jeff into his office at the end of the day. Jeff, would you step in here for a second? Sure, coach, Jeff answered, closing his locker. He stepped into the office. What's up, coach? Close the door, Jeff, and sit down. Jeff did so. How are things going this year, Jeff? I think we've got a good group, coach. They'll do fine. Before or after you run them into the ground? He asked in a quiet voice and a slight smile. Coach? Jeff, you're pushing the midfielders pretty hard. You're going to break them before the season even starts at this pace. You know me, coach. I run the midfield hard and we're always ready for the year. It's a little more than that this year, Jeff. I heard about Pauline. That brought Jeff up short. He rewound the week in his head and played back the scenes. He realized the coach was correct. Geez, coach, you're right, he said a moment later, shocked at his behavior. I understand, Jeff, it's not a problem. Coach, I'm sorry. Jeff, it's not a problem, don't worry about it, Coach Romanov assured him. It won't happen again, Jeff assured him. Jeff, take a breath, it's fine, it's handled. Jeff swallowed. Yes, sir. Go on home, I'll see you in the morning. Yes, sir he repeated as he stood. Jeff wandered back out to the locker room, grabbing his bag before heading to his car. He sat in the driver's seat for a long while before putting the car in drive. Jeff opened his locker to retrieve the books for his first class. he just finished his preschool workout. Since Pauline left for school, Jeff had been working out with a single-mindedness that shocked even him. Jeff felt a gentle hand on his shoulder. He turned to see Kathy Stein standing there along with Jack Jarrett. Kathy looked at him in sorrow and gave him a big hug and a kiss on the cheek. Jeff, I'm so sorry, and she whispered. Thanks, Kathy, he replied. It's not like we didn't know this was coming, but it does still hurt. You wouldn't be who you are if it didn't, Jeff, Kathy said as Jack stepped forward to pat him on the shoulder. Jeff nodded to his friend as he felt another body hug him. 
It was Allison Newberry. She had fit right in with his small group of close friends. Part of him did notice that she looked phenomenal this year. Other friends patted him on the shoulder or hugged him. As they expressed their condolences to him, Jeff didn't notice that Allison continued to stand next to him. Hey, Kathy called to a morose-looking Allison in their first period English class. Allison looked over, and Kathy asked, What's wrong? Nothing, Allison said in an almost inaudible voice. Survey says, Kathy responded, Your face is dragging on the ground, Missy. Now spill it. Jeff didn't even notice me when I hugged him, Allison said. You're kidding me, right? His girlfriend of 18 months just left for college walking right out of his life. He wouldn't notice a supernova exploding next to him right now. Kathy pointed her finger at Allison. You, my not-so-smart, smart smart friend, need to learn a new vocab word, persistence. What do you mean? You stick to that boy like glue. One of these days, if you stick it out, he's going to pull his head out of the sand and notice you. Crap, he'll have to be dead or gay not to at that point. Allison let out a breath. She could do this. At least Kathy thought she could. Okay, she said to her classmate. Okay, how should I do this? Kathy looked up while Mr. Fenneman rose from his desk to start the lesson. Walk with me after class, she whispered. Allison nodded, then turned her attention to her teacher. 24 September 1986, Hardwick Road, Enfield, Massachusetts. Jeff felt more in control of himself after he chatted with the coach. He still pushed the midfielders hard at practice, but he wasn't running them into early graves any longer. Today, Tompkins hosted Amherst Pelham Regional today for the fifth game of the season. Midway through the second half, with the score tied at 1-1, Tompkins' goalie cleared the ball with a booming punt that sailed past the midfield line. Jeff fought for position while the ball came down near him. Jeff cut towards the other team's goal as the opposing player gathered himself, attempting to head the ball away. Without Jeff to push against, the other player fell to the ground. The ball continued down the field, with Jeff pursuing it unmarked. He dribbled it down the sideline, keeping track of his teammates while he ran. The other team moved to defend him. At the corner of the penalty box, Jeff crossed the ball in a high, arcing pass. The opposing goalie came out to challenge for the ball. He had the advantage as the only player allowed to use his hands. It may have worked out better for the other goalie had he made contact with the ball when he punched at it. The player next to him was Peter Dufresne a forward for Tompkins. The ball passed the goalie and into a position for Peter to head it into the net. Chris Miklich grabbed him around the neck before they joined their teammates for the celebration. The game ended in Tompkins' fifth straight win. So what classes are you taking over at Swerve again? Jack asked Allison at lunch the following week. Swerve was the unofficial nickname of Swift River Valley Community College in Enfield Village. Calculus two this semester and Calc three next I should be well ahead of my peers when I get to college. Where are you going to apply? Kathy asked. I'll be applying to MIT early decision. Jack let out a low whistle even though the other three friends weren't surprised. What about you guys? My first choice is Johns Hopkins for pre-med, Jack answered. NYU for computer science for me, Kathy added. I'm still not sure, Jeff said. Allison looked at him out of the corner of her eye but said nothing. Jack and Kathy didn't notice the exchange. Allison cornered Jeff after their next class and pushed him outside. What the hell's going on, she demanded. With what? Don't play coy with me, Jeff. You lied to your best friends at lunch. You lied to me. Why? He waved her to a bench. I'm sorry, Allison. I can't afford for my mom to find out yet. About what? She asked, exasperated. Allison, I'm not applying to college. What? I'm not going to be applying because I'll be enlisting in the army. Allison's eyes nearly fell out of her head. What? Your mom's going to flip? With your GPA? And with as hard as you're being scouted? He shrugged. It doesn't seem as important in comparison. Can I ask you not to tell Jack or Kathy yet? I don't need my parents finding out before I tell them myself. She hugged him. Of course not. I won't say anything until you say it's okay. I know I have to tell my parents eventually but not just yet. Jeff searched for something unusual in the attic three weeks after his conversation with Allison. His mother's birthday was coming up in another three weeks at the end of October. 
He wanted to find something to go with his present to her. His mother and sister were off shopping together today, while his father tried to catch up on work at his garage. Jeff flipped through papers in an unlabeled box he'd never noticed before. Most of the paperwork in the box dated from the mid to late 1940s. In it, Jeff discovered pictures of a man he resembled more than the man he knew as his grandfather. That man wore World War II era clothes. As Jeff continued to leaf through the box, he came across more pictures of George McLaren with his grandmother. Grandma Kaolis appeared to be pregnant in some of the photos. Jeff also found letters addressed to his grandmother. The handwritten letters were grouped together with their envelopes. He unfolded the yellowing papers and read each letter. George McLaren described what he could of the military training of those days. World War II censorship didn't allow much detail. The letters started a month after December 7, 1941. George McLaren enlisted in the Army the day after the attack on Pearl Harbor. Jeff followed his biological grandfather's training progression over the next few months. Grandpa McLaren, as Jeff began to think of him, described basic training in general terms. He continued on to artillery training and then volunteered for the Airborne. Grandpa McLaren's later letters described the Normandy invasion and its buildup. He wrote to Grandma once he returned safely to England. George McLaren's last letter was dated September 14, 1944. The next letter in a pile proved to be a Western Union telegram. Grandpa McLaren had died in the invasion of Holland on September 20th, 1944. One page brought him up short. <laughs> the page was a notarized copy of a legal document, an adoption decree from the probate court of Hampshire County, Massachusetts, Northampton. <laughs> the document announced that Nicholas Keolis of Pelham, his grandfather, had adopted one Marissa McLaren. The date on the decree read May 20, 1948. His mother would have been five and a half years old at the time. Her biological father never got the chance to meet her. Jeff carried the box down to his car. He drove to his father's garage on Route 21 near Belchertown. There he found his father working on a car's engine. Joe looked up when he noticed someone entering the service base. Hey Jeff, what brings you by to visit your old man? Jeff said nothing as he set the banker's box down. He lifted the lid and extracted a single piece of paper. Jeff extended the adoption decree without a word. Joe's smile faded when he recognized what his son held. Joe set his wrench down and waved his son towards the office while he wiped his hands. Where'd you find that? Joe asked as he settled into the desk chair. In the attic. You just found it. Yes. Why keep this a secret? Does it matter, Joe asked, leaning forward on his desk. This is family history, Dad, Jeff cried. Yes, it is. More than that, it's important family history. But does it matter? Matter, Jeff echoed. Of course it matters. Does it? Joe replied. Are you ever going to meet George McLaren? There are no more McLarens in the area. George was an only child, so there are no McLaren cousins. Is Nick Coyoles now no longer your grandfather? Jeff didn't reply right away as he considered the questions. No, Dad. When you put it like that, I guess it doesn't matter, he responded minutes later. Grandpa's the only grandfather I've ever known. I never got to meet your parents. Joe's parents died before Jeff and Kara were born. Joe nodded. Do me a favor. Don't mention this to your mother, or your sister for that matter. Take the box back up to the attic and make sure it's back where you found it. When you finish at the house, meet me over at the lunch car. I'll finish up the Lincoln, head over there, and save us a table. The Knox men shared a table for lunch 30 minutes later. The Enfield lunch car was Joe's favorite diner in the valley, a love his son shared. Jeff ordered two eggs on corned beef hash, his usual. He thought comfort food might help settle his mind. Jeff looked at his father with an expectant gaze. Joe ignored him until he finished ordering. His father waited for the waitress to leave and took a sip of his water before he spoke. Jeff, your mother and I have never brought up what you found for one simple reason. Your mother gets near irrational if you even bring up the subject, his father explained. She was close to seven months pregnant with you when I first discovered that same box. I asked her about it and she had an actual conniption. She was so angry and I thought she'd go into early labor. 
It took me nearly an hour to calm her down. Why we have that box and not your grandmother, I don't know. Joe sipped at his water again. Grandma met Grandpa in 1945, after VJ Day. They married in late 47, and he filed for adoption immediately. The court finalized the decree, and that was it. Grandpa's girls from his first marriage, your aunts consider your mother their sister, not stepsister sister. End of story. Your mother tries to lock away her feelings on the subject, yet she keeps that box. Be very careful what you do with this knowledge, Jeff. Jeff didn't know how to reply. They ate lunch in silence. Tompkins's soccer team powered through their schedule. They compiled a near-perfect record of 15-1 and, and captured the first seed in their conference tournament in mid-October. That's when the wheels came off the bus. Wilbraham Academy, the eighth seed, rolled right over them in the tournament's opening game. Tompkins seemed like they were checking off every possible mental mistake from an invisible list. Their play was uninspired. They were out of position. They were a step behind on every play. Even Jeff played below his usual level. He wasn't far off his norm, but it was noticeable. Wilbraham won five to Neil. Well, shit, Jeff said to himself. He stood at midfield with his hands on his hips while his high school soccer career ended with a whimper. One of Wilbraham's seniors stopped him as the two teams shook hands. Hey, you're a senior this year too, right? Yeah, Jeff admitted. The glory days are coming to an end. I hear you're being scouted for baseball already, though. The other boy played the same three sports as he did, though Jeff didn't know his name. Yeah, but I'm not sure which way I'm gonna go. Jeff knew that the other player thought Jeff meant he wasn't sure whether to choose college or pro sports. Jeff saw no reason to correct that assumption. How's life as a sort of college student? Jeff asked Allison as the four friends ate lunch. It's okay, Allison shrugged. My, aren't we enthusiastic? Jack muttered before taking a bite of his grinder. The classes are fine, Allison said. Not having you guys around is a bummer. We're not going to be with you at whatever polytechnic university you wind up at next year, Allison, Kathy pointed out. Allison stuck her tongue out at her while throwing a corn chip at Jeff. Hey, a startled Jeff exclaimed. I didn't say anything. No, but you were thinking something, I could tell. What is this, 1984? Exactly, Allison replied, nodding. A thought crime. Jeff rolled his eyes. How are you guys doing in your classes here? Jack shrugged, answering for all of them. Okay, I guess. Mid-semester grades will be out Friday. Nothing less than a 90 on any test, quiz, or paper for me. Same here, Kathy added. Still in the early lead in our Spanish class, Allison, Jeff bragged to her. She grimaced. Jeff had scored two or three points higher than Allison on every assignment turned in or test taken in Spanish 5 this year. It's a marathon, not a sprint, she pointed out. Jeff gave her a look. I'm the athlete. I'll handle the sports cliches, okay? Jeff wiped his face with a towel while he sat on the bench. He gulped water before he lowered the cage on his hockey helmet. He watched as Chris Miklich practiced defensive scenarios with his new partner, Ryan Demings. Ryan was a freshman. Coach Kessler split their defensive pairing after two years together because Coach said he needed to spread their defensive strength to other lines. Jeff wasn't so sure that was a good strategy. The new pairings were okay, but neither had the pop that he and Chris seemed to have together, however. They lacked the near telepathic foreknowledge of what the other was about to do. Still, the man was the coach, not Jeff. Chris came off the ice and sat next to Jeff on the bench. The pair shared a look. Chris shrugged at him as if to say, it is what it is. Jeff, did you get those college applications done? Not yet, Mom. The deadlines are at the beginning of January, she reminded him yet again. You won't have much time if you keep putting it off. Jeff fought not to shake his head until his mother left the room. He still had two months before the end of the year to finish the applications if he decided to. His mother's questions about them came more and more often, and it was becoming harder and harder to put her off. The Tompkins Black Bears were a disappointing three and five by the first week of December. Coach Kessler's defensive experiment had worked, partially. The new pairings could hold teams at the blue line most games, but 
Once other teams had momentum in the games, the defense could not break that momentum. There was no sense that Tompkins would suddenly turn on an opponent. John Kessler sighed as he looked at the chalkboard in his office. He had all the line assignments written on it, along with the special teams assignments. He sighed again and erased the defensive line assignments. Putting Chris and Jeff on his first line again, the pair were also together on every special teams assignment. Gotta change our luck, the coach thought. Gnox, Miklich, my office, he bellowed two hours later. The pair soon stood in front of his desk, half-dressed for practice. You two are back together, first line. The two looked at each other in disbelief, then smiles split their faces. Power play, penalty kill, and extra man as well. You'd better start kicking butt if we want to make the playoffs. On it, coach, Jeff assured him. Hit the ice. Agawam High School waltzed into Tompkins two days later, expecting an easy game. They had heard Tompkins was now a shadow of its former self. They got the easy game, but were on the wrong end of the equation. Chris and Jeff combined for five goals and were responsible for three Agawam players needing smelling salts due to clean checks. Tompkins won seven to one. Their next four opponents met the same fate as Agawam. Tompkins spent entire games in their opponents' defensive ends, peppering their goalies with shots. It was not unusual for shot counts to be in Tompkins' favor by a ratio of five to one. By the end of the fall semester, Tompkins' record was eight and five. Things were looking up. On the ice, Jeff worked on his physics homework at the dining room table the week before Christmas. School would let out for the holidays in two days, on the 19th. Time to set the table, Jeff. Got it, Mom. Dinner was his mother's grape leaves along with lamb shish kebabs and pilaf. Jeff would be buried in similar dishes at his mom's family's Christmas party on Saturday. All of that side's aunts, uncles, and cousins would descend on his Aunt Marilyn's house in Dana for the annual event. His father was an only child with no cousins, so nothing similar happened with the Knox family. Great as always, Mom. Joe and Kara made noises that they agreed with Jeff while they cleared the table. Thanks, everyone. Jeff, have you narrowed down your college choices? You don't have much time left. Jeff's stomach dropped. He couldn't put the conversation off any longer. Mom, could I talk to you and Dad for a minute, please? Kara gave him a look. He gave her a slight shake of his head in return. She smiled at him and left the room. Jeff sat back down at the table with his parents. What's up, honey? His mother asked him. Mom, I'm not going to be filling out those applications. I'm not sure I'm following you, Jeff. I'm not filling out those applications because I'm not going to college next year. What do you mean you're not going to college? His mother demanded. Marisa's voice started quiet and cold but rose in volume as she asked the question. Jeff's conversation with his parents about his plans after high school was not going well, and it had only just started. I don't feel that I want to go to college, Mom. At least not right away. That's mainly because I still don't know what I want to do at college. I know I don't want to major in baseball. What about the history programs you've been thinking about, Jeff? His father asked, trying to play mediator. And what about all of the college and pro baseball teams that have been scouting you? History is probably the way I'll wind up going when I eventually get to college, Dad. The bottom line is that I don't feel that I'm ready for college, or for college or pro baseball either. Jeff dropped the bomb. I want to enlist in the army first. What? His mother squawked. Absolutely not. I forbid it. She punctuated her displeasure by slapping the table. Mom, I turn 18 in August. If you or dad won't sign the permission slip for me to enlist before that, I will enlist on my birthday. I'm sorry, but at that point, it becomes my life. Marisa glared at her oldest child before storming out without another word. Jeff sighed as he watched his mother leave. He turned to his father. Sorry, Dad, but I figured that's the way this conversation would go. Joe Knox sighed also. There's no way this conversation would have ever been acceptable to your mother. Not with that as the punchline. You know about her father, though I don't think she knows that you know. 
Privately, I will say that I'm proud of you for wanting to serve your country. Joe sighed again, looking at the ceiling. It's going to be cold in our room tonight. Turning back to his son, Joe said, Bring me the permission slip, and I'll sign it, as long as you promise me that you'll finish high school. You have that promise, Dad. Besides, they won't take me if I don't. There was a knock at his bedroom door as Jeff finished his math homework one night in early January. Come in. His door slowly opened and his sister stuck her head in. Jeff, got a minute? Hey, Kara, sure, come on in. The two siblings were well past the annoying brother-sister stage of their relationship. They had relied on each other for advice and insight for three years now. Kara entered and closed the door behind her. What's up, sis? Jeff, what's going on with you and mom? Kara asked. The two of you are barely speaking to each other. You seem like you've been tiptoeing around each other for close to a month for some reason. Neither Jeff nor his parents had said anything else about their talk in December, so it wasn't surprising that Kara didn't know what had happened. Jeff handed her a few pamphlets about the army he received from his recruiter in response to her question. The army? Geez, no wonder. What prompted this? Jeff shrugged. I can't precisely say, kiddo. It's what seems right when I think about my future. I mean, I can go to college anytime. Heck, I can even try out for a pro baseball team later if I want to. But how many chances will I get to serve my country? I know, Jeff. But does this mean you're never coming back? This is still my home, he assured her. If not this house, definitely this state. I can't imagine wanting to live anywhere else permanently after I leave the army. Could you imagine having Christmas or Thanksgiving without all of our cousins around? Kara shivered. I don't know if I could get used to that. Exactly. So what are you going to in the army? My recruiter put down my preferences as infantry, airborne, rangers. We'll see what I get. He's pretty confident I'll get the first two, but he's not sure about the third. I scored high on a practice placement test, but volunteering for the infantry and the airborne seems like it will trump that. I get that as a mother she's scared, but why is mom so against this? From what I've found out, Grandpa Keolis isn't mom's biological father. What do you mean, Jeff? The man who was mom's biological father died in the invasion of Holland during World War II. Operation Market Garden, it was called. Like many of that generation, her father enlisted right after Pearl Harbor. I'm not sure how old she was when she found out about that fact, but I think she's more than a bit resentful that he wasn't around, and it's colored her viewpoint. Grandpa Keolis isn't mom's real dad. Biological dad, Kara. The correct term is biological. Grandpa raised her and her sisters. He loves her, our aunts and grandma. He is a real dad, Jeff cautioned. Anyway, that's my theory is on why she's so upset. I guess that makes it a bit clearer, she admitted. Don't forget there's the whole not going to college thing too, especially when you look at my grades from a college preparatory school like Tompkins, someone with my GPA. I'm definitely supposed to be going to college. So my big brother is going to be a soldier? That's the plan. 12th of January, 1987, Hardwick Road, Enfield, Massachusetts. Jeff put his lunch down across from Allison Newbury at their normal table. They'd been eating together every day since September. Kathy and Jack joined them for lunch most days, but today they were off on their own. Jeff appreciated how his best friends had tried to keep his spirits up during the difficult first few weeks after Paul and his departure. Today something clicked for Jeff while he listened to Allison. He smiled at her as she kept talking. What? She asked when she noticed him smiling at her. Do I have something in my teeth? Jeff reached over and put his hand on top of hers. Thank you. For what? What did I do? You, Kathy, Jack, and our other friends have helped me keep my head up this year. Thank you. Allison blushed. Jeff stroked his thumb over the back of her hand, causing Allison to shiver. You've been waiting, haven't you? Waiting? For me to notice what an incredible person you are, he replied. For me to notice, really notice, how brilliant you are? 
How beautiful. How generous. Yes. Tears of happiness filled her eyes. You think I'm pretty? I said you were beautiful, Allison. He corrected her. But even that pales in comparison to how brilliant you are. I'm no dummy, but you could think circles around me with one hemisphere tied behind your back. She giggled at that. Would you like to do something together Friday night? Allison gasped as a smile spread across her face. Yes. As beautiful as Allison was, her smile was glorious. Jeff realized he wanted to see it as often as possible. Jeff held his hand to the small of Allison's back days later as the hostess led them to their table in the upscale restaurant. He kept a neutral expression on his face as the rest of the patrons watched the young couple cross the dining room. Reaching the table, Jeff held Allison's chair for her while she sat. He sat across the table. Their waitress took their non-alcoholic pre-dinner drink orders. Allison leaned forward and whispered a question to Jeff when the sever left. What was everyone looking at when we came in? Jeff's water glass paused halfway to his lips. He set it back down on the table. You're kidding me, right? No, why? Allison, everyone here is wondering what some high school kid is doing escorting a gorgeous college-age woman into a well-regarded restaurant. Jeff saw the uncertain look on her face. Allison emerged from her cocoon with Kathy Stein's help over the summer, but her self-confidence took longer to appear. Gone were the unflattering outfits and posture, and in their place was the stunning young lady across the table from him. Jeff pressed ahead. Allison, my pulse has been racing since you opened your door tonight, and not just because this is our first date. I know I've told you that you're beautiful at school, but with that dress and the way your hair looks tonight, my God, she blushed again. You, Allison, are a stunning young woman. Boys are intimidated by you, aren't they? Yes. Usually it's the whole likely valedictorian thing that throws them, though. She cocked her head, regarding him closer. But you aren't intimidated by me at all, are you? You remember what I said earlier this week, right? I like being able to have an intelligent conversation with someone. There's a reason I choose to surround myself with people who don't pepper their speech with um and like. People who care about others. People who don't just think about themselves. My reasons for hanging around you weren't exactly altruistic, she pointed out. Maybe not. Funny how I don't care. The Black Bears hockey comeback faltered after the Christmas break. They lost their first game after school restarted, though they won the next two. They won half of their games through the end of February. Another five-game winning streak allowed them to make it back into the state tournament. Pittsfield High School exploited the team's lack of depth in the first game. The number one seed found seams in Tompkins' other defensive lines and led 3-0. to zero. After their latest shift, Chris and Jeff skated off the ice with less than seven minutes remaining in the second period. They would have a minute or two at most to rest. They watched while Pittsfield's offense sped up again and peppered their goalie with shot after shot. We're stopping them when we're out there, but they're cutting the other lines apart, Chris said to Jeff. I've been trying to tell these guys all game, but they aren't listening. We'll do what we can. We stand them up at the blue line, make them play dump and chase, make them pay for every puck they win. The pair retook the ice with 4.37 left in the period. Chris and Jeff did everything they could to keep Tompkins in the game. For their next three shifts, they became snipers and enforcers. They fired shot after shot from the point, and they crushed opposing players trying to get past them into the boards. Chris scored just before the second intermission, on a turnover Jeff forced. Jeff blindly flipped the puck out of Tompkins' zone and across the ice to a streaking Chris. Chris flew unopposed into the Pittsfield end of the ice and faked their goalie into sprawling on the ice. He put the puck into the wide open net with a casual forehand wrist shot. The period ended with Tompkins trailing four to one. Coach, give me a second in there without the coaching staff, okay? John Kessler raised an eyebrow. You're the captain. Thanks, one of us will come out in a bit. Jeff handed his stick, helmet, and gloves to one of the assistant coaches. And the coaches looked at each other in amusement while they stood in the hall. They knew what was about to happen. Jeff entered the visitor's locker room and stood among his teammates. He turned slowly to look at all of them. Well, it was a great year, guys. Go ahead and put your uniforms in the hamper so they can wash them. 
his teammates looked confused. Uh, Jeff? There's still another period to play, Sean Layton, a sophomore forward, commented. Really? There is? That's weird. Cause you sure as shit aren't playing like it. His abrupt change in demeanor stunned his teammates. Are you guys happy to be here? Are you happy about the opportunity to play in the state tournament? Don't be. Start playing like you want to win it. I don't know about you, but I'm playing to win the state championship. The school won one back in 85, remember? Do you guys even notice the banner on the back wall of the field house anymore? I look at it every damn day every time I take the ice in that building. Some of us were part of that team. We weren't supposed to win that. Hell, we weren't even supposed to be in the same building as the teams we played during that whole tournament. But we fought. We were the lower seed in every game and we fought. We took the number one seed in the whole state to overtime in the final. And we won. We won because we didn't give up. We played to the whistle on every play. Keep your heads up. Keep your sticks down. Finish your checks. Don't give up. Coach Kessler and the rest of his staff have given us everything they could give over the season. They've given us every bit of knowledge and encouragement they have. They've shown us what to do, what to expect, and how to adjust to any situation. They gave us the tools, but we have to play the game. I've been trying to tell you guys that all year. We have 20 minutes left in this game. For the seniors on the team, for me, this may be the last 20 minutes of competitive hockey we'll ever play. I'm going out there and put it all on the line. You'll have to carry me on and off the bus and I'll probably sleep through it. Are you guys going to do the same thing? If you're not going to give me everything you have left, I'll go get the guys from the middle school team and skate with them instead. Jeff walked out of the locker room and collapsed into a chair by the door. Nice speech, coach, John Kessler joked to his captain. Jeff looked up. I'm not going even to try and follow that up. You said everything I wanted to say. We'll see how it works out, coach. Jeff sat in the hall until the team filed out for the third period. He collected his equipment from the coaches and headed out to the ice with his teammates. There was a noticeable increase in the speed of Tompkins' warm-up skate. The players wore more determined looks on their faces than before. Pittsfield didn't know what hit them at first. Tompkins scored two goals within the first five minutes of the final period. The forwards harassed Pittsfield in their own end. The defense kept the pressure on in the neutral zone and by the Tompkins net. Pittsfield couldn't keep possession long enough to get a shot off. They didn't have a shot on net until nine minutes left in the third. Pittsfield got a lucky bounce with less than five minutes left in the game. Their center redirected a shot into the Tompkins net to go up five to three. Coach Kessler called his players over to the bench while Pittsfield celebrated. This is it, gentlemen, 422 left in the game. Dig deep, give it everything that you have. The whistle blew calling the players back onto the ice. Pittsfield was mistaken if they expected Tompkins to fold after the goal. The eighth-seeded team charged at them as if the game had just started. Their defensive lines kept the puck out of the Tompkins' end and pinned Pittsfield in theirs. Shot after shot peppered the Pittsfield goalie and forced him to perform. Tompkins pulled their goalie with 90 seconds remaining, adding an extra forward to the attack. There was to be no miracle for this hockey team, however. Pittsfield regained possession of the puck in their end with 30 seconds left in the game. Their player turned and flipped the puck as far down the ice as he could. Jeff dug as hard as he could for the puck. He dove, sliding across the ice on his stomach in an attempt to knock the puck offline. He missed. The puck slid into Tompkins' empty net to put Pittsfield up 6-3 with 22 seconds left. Jeff punched the ice in frustration. Pittsfield won the ensuing face-off. They were content to skate the puck back into their end and run out the clock. The Tompkins players skated out to their goal and shared one last moment on the ice. I'm proud of you guys, Coach Kessler said. You didn't quit. You took the fight to them that last period, but it just wasn't our day. Forget about how the season went. Forget about how the first two-thirds of this game went. Remember how you played for those last 20 minutes and be proud of that effort. Let's line up. The bus ride back to Enfield was almost silent. A few players talked, but most of them were exhausted and napped. Jeff was one of the latter. Chris woke him up when they pulled back into the parking lot at Tompkins. Jeff carried a bag of team equipment into the field house after putting his bag in his car. 
Jeff wandered out to the unlit rink once he dropped the equipment bag in the locker room. He looked out across the frozen surface and at the empty seats while he stood by the benches. He looked into the rafters, catching sight of the state championship banner hanging by the far wall. An arm snaked around his waist. He smiled down at Allison. You okay? She asked. Yeah. I was thinking about how the crowd sounded when we played at home. I hear that rally after you won the state championship was pretty cool too. That it was. You must be exhausted. Come on, we're heading back to my house. Dad made ribs tonight and we saved you some. Jeff held the door for Allison and took one last look at the ice. Jeff, Allison, Kathy and Jack sat at their usual lunch table two weeks later, in mid-March. They'd sat at the same table for years. Jeff smiled to himself while he watched his friends laugh and joke about something as they ate. They would agree that they were all each other's best friends. Jeff's smile slipped when he realized that he might never see any of them again after graduation in three months. Allison, easily the most brilliant student at the school, was destined for the hard sciences. She'd study a branch of astronomy, and he figured at least one PhD was in her future. Jack was aiming for medical school. Kathy had her eye on the growing field of computer science. His future lay as a soldier in the army, even if for only four years. That could prove to be the most uncertain future of all. Allison saw the sorrow on her boyfriend's face. Jeff, what's wrong? I was just wondering if I'll ever see you guys again after we graduate in June. Allison reached across the table and held Jeff's hand. Shaking off the bad feelings, Jeff asked, Allison, since I don't want to assume that we're going, would you go to the prom with me? I've already got my dress, but I was just waiting on you. Get a basic black tuxedo again this year and you'll be fine. I'm sorry I waited so long. I was going to ask you if you didn't get off the stick soon, Allison replied, pointing a fork full of her salad at him. Do you want to plan on me driving you home after or... Allison lifted an eyebrow. I mean, not that, but, uh, crap. Allison laughed at his discomfort. I know that's not what you meant, Jeff. I think I'd like to hang out with you and our friends for as long as possible that night, so long as we don't run into any parental roadblocks. I'll start looking into it then. The Tompkins baseball team cheered as they watched Jeff's latest hit sail towards the fence. They'd seen 11 other such shots launched over the past two months. For this hit, there was no doubt it would be a home run. It continued to rise as it flew over the outfielder's heads. Jeff rounded the bases with his usual speed. Nice hit, babe, Ryan Demings commented when Jeff returned to the bench. Jeff finished his sports drink. I'm a Red Sox fan, Ryan. Nice hit, Ted Williams would be more appropriate, don't you think? Yeah, yeah. Hey, I don't see too many scouts here today. The guys told me the place was full of them last year. I'm guessing that when they draft seniors, the teams expect those players to show up at camp or go to college, not to basic training. No point expending the effort here. What do you mean? Ryan, I'm enlisting in the army after I graduate. What? Ryan asked, eyes wide. Jeff's plans after graduation hadn't been common knowledge until now, though the scouts knew. He figured it didn't matter who else knew now less than a month before graduation. The news would be all over the school by the next morning. Jeff shrugged. It's what I feel I should do, Ryan. Tompkins School held their 1987 junior-senior prom the following weekend. It would be the last major school event before graduation. This year, the prom committee pulled off a coup, securing the swanky Cliffside Hotel in Prescott as the venue. The young men and women who attended stood around the Cliffside's function room when it finished, talking in small groups. Though the dance ended 20 minutes ago, they didn't want the evening to end. The chaperones helped the hotel staff clear the room. Allison and Jeff held each other around the waist as they crossed the lobby to the elevators. Their friendship had deepened over the semester. Jeff regretted the possibility that they'd never see each other again after they graduated. Allison and Jeff's parents, minus Marissa, agreed to split the cost of a room along with Jack and Kathy's. The parents agreed as long as the two couples agreed not to leave the hotel. The four friends scored a suite on the top floor of the hotel's new addition. A few others headed up to rooms at the cliffside, 
Most of the event goers left the hotel for whatever parties others hosted. The number of people headed upstairs was small due to the price of the cliffside's rooms. Jeff and his friends changed into more comfortable clothes and hung out in the suite's common area together. Soda was the drink of choice for them as they shared one more high school memory. It was after two in the morning when they all began to get tired. Jack led Kathy to the bedroom they claimed, bid their friends good night, and shut the door. Allison and Jeff walked to the other bedroom. Allison washed up in the bathroom before bed. While she did so, Jeff went hunting for an extra pillow and blanket so he could crash on the couch. He turned from the closet with both in hand as Allison emerged. What do you think you're doing? She asked him, fists on her hips and a scowl on her face. Getting a pillow and blanket, I was going to sleep on the couch out there. Oh no you don't, mister, she said in a stern voice. You climb into bed this minute. I want to sleep with you, even if that means we're just going to sleep. Um, okay, unless you don't want to. Allison, just because you are way smarter than I am, don't assume that I'm an idiot. Jeff dumped the bedding on a chair and turned off the room's overhead lights. He walked back to the bed, shut off the lamp on his nightstand, and lay motionless on his side of the bed. Jeff, would it be okay if I snuggled up to you tonight? Would it be okay if a beautiful young woman snuggled up to me to sleep? Hmm, let me think. She slapped his arm, causing him to chuckle before he lifted that arm and wrapped it around her. He realized how much he missed the feeling when she pressed up against him. Allison sighed as she came into contact with him. Thank you for tonight, Allison, he whispered, giving her a gentle squeeze. Thank you, Jeff. You've given me a night to remember, a positive memory of high school that I wasn't sure I would experience when I moved here in 85. It's no less than you deserve, Allison. You're going to make the right guy a lucky man someday. Jeff collapsed onto the bed the next morning. He was exhausted, and his arms were screaming. The sweat from his back soaked the sheets and matted his hair to his head. Holy crap, he exclaimed. I thought I was in shape. Allison giggled, nipping at one of his earlobes. You are such a stud. You're gonna have to speak up. I think this stud is deaf in his left ear now, and you screamed into a pillow for God's sake. I'm glad I opened that envelope from our parents when I got up to use the bathroom, Allison said. The envelope held a letter from all four sets of parents, minus Marissa, letting the young couples know that they also paid for the suite for a second night. The four high school seniors could spend another whole day together. Allison rolled back onto Jeff's chest and looked him in the eye. I want to try a few more things with you. Uh, don't worry, you'll survive. Well, probably. At the pitcher didn't turn to watch the flight of the ball while it sailed toward the left field fence. His left fielder didn't turn either. Both players walked off the field as the Tompkins team crowded behind home plate. Jeff slowed his run to a trot for his trip around the bases. The game he just won with his home run had no significance, except to him. Tompkins wasn't going to the playoffs because of the win, and their opponent wouldn't miss the playoffs because they lost. The only reason the game was significant was that it was Jeff's last high school baseball game. The game was tied 4-4 in the bottom of the seventh inning when he stepped to the plate. He turned on a hanging first pitch curveball and drove it four rows deep into the parking lot. His teammates mobbed him when he touched the plate, making sure not to touch him until he did so. He took off his helmet before reaching home, so his fellow players slapped him on the back instead of on the head. He would keep his hearing a while longer. John Kessler held out his hand to Jeff before he re-entered the dugout. It's been my pleasure to be your coach, Jeff. That's a fitting way for you to end your baseball career. Jeff's post-high school plans were well known at this point. Yeah. Winning another state championship for you would have been pretty cool too, coach. Hey, that one in hockey two years ago is more than most people ever get. Let's not be greedy. He clapped Jeff on the shoulder and motioned for him to enter the dugout. In the dugout, his teammates shook his hand again while they gathered their equipment. The seniors tried to pick up some of the team's equipment, but the underclassmen had beaten them to it all. Hey, Jeff. Jeff looked up to see Allison beckoning him over to the gate at the end of the dugout. She leaned over the fence and planted a big kiss on the hero of the hour when he walked over. 
If I walk away, then come back, will I get another kiss like that? What he got was swatted. Jeff, Mr. Hammersmith wanted to shake your hand. Allison indicated the older man with her, a gentleman he'd seen in the stands at his games. He was the one scout who still showed up. Good to finally meet you, Mr. Hammersmith, Jeff offered along with his hand. Same here, Jeff. Allison told me that you've already signed a contract with the Army, so I don't think we'll get in too much trouble for actually talking to one another. I just wanted to say that it's been a pleasure watching you play over the last two years, and that I wish you luck for the future. Thanks, Mr. Hammersmith. I'm sure I would have enjoyed playing for whichever organization wound up drafting me, but the Army feels like the right choice for me. The man on the other side of the fence nodded. Nothing to apologize for there, Jeff. Although I do have to say I'm partial to the Marine Corps myself. A small, gold Marine Corps pin adorned the man's collar. I wouldn't have gone wrong had I chosen the Marines, sir. Family history, though. Simon Hammersmith nodded. Tradition means a lot. Best of luck to you, then. Thank you, sir. Miss. He nodded to Allison. He walked to a car by the edge of the field and was gone. Jeff tossed his bat bag over his shoulder and an arm around Allison. They started walking back to the field house. Jeff sang to Allison in an exaggerated voice. Glory days. Well, they'll pass you by. Glory days. In the wink of a young girl's eye. Glory days, glory days. Allison swatted him again. Durham 9 to June 1987. Blackington Road, New Salem, Massachusetts. Jeff sat with Allison, Kathy, and Jack at Allison's graduation party the day after the ceremony. Jeff explained to his friends what the atmosphere was like at his family's table during the post-graduation lunch. The previous day, nobody spoke a word. There was no graduation party planned at the Knox household either. Jeff was surprised that his mother had even shown up to graduation. That sounds like it was awkward, Jack said. You're a master of understatement, Mr. Jarrett. So when do you leave, Jeff? Kathy asked. I'm scheduled to report for basic training early in the morning on July 6th. I'll fly out of Bradley the day before. And things at home aren't any better? He gave Kathy a look. Yeah, didn't think so. What are you going to do, Jeff? Asked Jack. Jeff shrugged. Enjoy the time I have left here with my friends. Mom can be part of that if she wants, but if she doesn't, it's not my problem. What do you mean you're going to leave early, Allison cried, her face falling. I'm sorry, Allison, he replied while she buried her face in his chest. I know I said three weeks ago that I wasn't going to let Mom's attitude affect me, but it's ten times worse now that school's out. The earliest I can leave is the first. If I don't leave soon, I'm going to say something I'll regret. I wish I didn't have to, but... Two days, she whispered. Jeff could see tears forming in her eyes. Jeff swore to himself almost a year ago that he'd never put himself in this position again. Of course, he should have realized that promise was not at all realistic. Jeff would leave the quiet valley where he grew up tomorrow. He didn't know when he was coming home again, despite what he told his sister in January. He hugged Mrs. Newbury, and she kissed his cheek good be. Mr. Newbury received a firm handshake. He thanked both of them for dinner and wished them well. He led Allison out onto her driveway and into the warm summer night. The pain of the impending separation was no less sharp now than it had been with Pauline the year before. It was even more acute for Allison, as it was her first relationship. Whoever said, "'Tis better to have loved and lost than to have never loved at all' needed a solid punch in the nose. Jeff kissed Allison goodbye one last time in painful cases of deja vu and role reversal. Reach for the stars, kid, he managed to croak out. You keep your head down, she sniffed. I'll send you my address at MIT as soon as I know what it is. Write to me when you can. Jeff nodded before climbing into his car. He made it three miles down the road before he had to pull over. Where are you going? I'm sleeping in the guest room tonight, Marisa, Joe answered. I have to get up early tomorrow, and I don't want to wake you. Seven. I don't want you to sleep there. I want you to sleep in here. And I want you to say goodbye to Jeff in the morning. Are you going to say goodbye to your son in the morning? Marisa was silent. 
I didn't think so. Your son said goodbye to his girlfriend last year, and you were there for him. He said goodbye to his girlfriend tonight, and where were you? Up here pouting, that's where. Pouting because he's not going to college, a choice he made, Marisa. He also chose to leave this house early because of you. You stole five days from him, Marisa, five days. Five days with Kara and me, five days with his friends, five days with Allison, a wonderful, brilliant girl you never bothered to get to know because your feelings are hurt. Our son is grown up, Marisa. Not growing up, but grown up, he can make his own choices. If you remember, he's been doing that since he was 13. I love you, Marisa. I've loved you for over 20 years. I say this because I love you. You are wrong. You've been wrong about this from day one. I've tried giving you room to get over your mad, but enough is enough. I'm telling you this right now. Kara and I will stay in contact with Jeff after he leaves. He is my son. He is her brother. You can choose to throw him away if you want, but we're keeping him. Deal with it. Joe opened the door to their bedroom. He turned back to his wife before he stepped through it. And in case you've forgotten, Marissa, I didn't go to college either. Joe looked over at his son while driving him to Windsor Locks Airport. Jeff stared out the window, having kept silent since they left the house. They were now only 20 minutes from their destination. The sun was starting to rise in the east. Jeff? Yeah, Dad? Jeff replied without turning away from the window. His voice was flat, emotionless. I'm sorry things are turning out this way for you. I've been trying to talk to your mother about this, but... Well, you know how she can be. Yeah, Dad, Jeff sighed. I do. He turned away from the window and faced his father. I'm sorry you've been in the middle of this, Dad. I didn't mean to come between you and Mom, but damn it, this is my life and my choice. I know it is, Jeff. On the one hand, I'm proud of you for taking charge of your life. On the other hand, as a dad, I'm nervous about what could happen. I guess I understand that at least somewhat, Dad. I can't say why I enlisted, other than I felt drawn to the army. I know I do well at college, but there's no subject calling to me yet. History will likely be my choice at some point. I'd just be wasting my time and your money right now. I know I didn't have to enlist as you did, but... Jeff turned back to the window. This is something I feel that I need to do, Dad. Joe Knox nodded at his son's words while negotiating the maze that was the airport's property. Jeff indicated that he only wanted to be dropped off and that Joe didn't need to come inside. You said the airline will honor that travel voucher four days early? Yeah, Dad. That's what the recruiting station said when I called the other day to check. Joe pulled the car to the curb and put the car in park. Well, yeah. You take care of yourself, Jeff, his father said his emotions wearing on him. Give it your best. Anything worth doing is worth doing right, right, Dad. Joe had said that to the kids over and over as they grew up. Joe didn't trust himself to speak anymore, so he held out his hand. Jeff grasped it in a firm grip. I promised Kara that I'd come home for her graduation if I can. Tell Mom I love her. Joe nodded. Love you too, Dad. Joe pulled his oldest into a firm hug. The two held the embrace. Jeff broke it a minute later, climbed out of the car, and retrieved his one bag from the back seat. He turned his back to the car and stood at the curb to gather himself. His father did the same before he pulled back into traffic. Jeff took another deep breath, picked up his bag, and entered the terminal. Joe sat on the back deck holding a beer, his lunch abandoned on the table in front of him. He hadn't touched either of them in 15 minutes, Joe couldn't really taste either of them, and he didn't feel like working. He would hurt himself or someone else in the garage today given how distracted he was right now. He'd been staring at the woods at the edge of the backyard for the past 10 minutes, but they held no answers today. Joe heard the screen door open behind him, glancing out of the corner of his eye when he turned his head. He saw Marisa step out of the house. He turned back to the trees. Marisa sat in the chair next to him. Joe? She asked softly. He continued to stare straight ahead, not answering. Joe, you didn't say anything when you got home. Did he get away okay? Who? Our son, Jeff. Oh, we have a son? I know I have a son. You haven't acted like you have a son at all for the last seven months. 
Joe saw Marisa hang her head. He heard her sobs moments later. The sobs grew in intensity as he listened. Joe's resolve broke, and he gathered his wife into his arms. Marissa's sobs grew louder as he did so, but they were now sobs of relief. She thought she'd driven Joe away with her attitude. He never spoke to her with the anger that had been in his voice last night. Last night was the loneliest night she'd ever spent in this house. Joe stroked her hair while she calmed down. Jeff asked me to tell you something before he got out of the car, Marisa. Joe's voice was far more gentle than it had been for the past 15 hours. What? He asked me to tell you that he loves you. Fresh tears fell, but they were silent tears. Those were your son's words, Marisa. The boy we raised said that before he walked into the terminal by himself. He won't be 18 until August, we both know that, but let him be the man he's trying to be. What should I do, Joe? For now, nothing, at least not when it comes to Jeff. Don't try to write or call him. Let him do this on his own. You okay, son? Asked the older gentleman to Jeff's left a couple of hours later. They shared the counter at a diner inside Atlanta's Hartsfield Airport. You look a mite lost. Doing all right, thank you, sir, on my way to Columbus, Georgia. Jeff shrugged, staring at his root beer float. My departure from home wasn't exactly the best. The older gentleman nodded his head as if he understood. Your parents didn't agree with your decision to enlist then? Jeff looked over at the man. There are precious few reasons a young Yankee like yourself would be traveling to Columbus, Georgia. I'm guessing you're heading for Fort Benning? Yes, sir, I am, but please don't call a Red Sox fan like me a Yankee. It turns my stomach, it does, especially after the way we lost to the Mets last year. Deja vu all over again. Indeed. And the man laughed and clapped the younger man on the shoulder. You've got a good attitude, son. That'll see you through your basic, at least. You going infantry? Yes, sir. I'll be at Benning until the middle of October. I'm doing basic AIT and airborne school there, all in a row. You joining up because you had to, or did you choose this yourself? No, my own choice, sir. I didn't feel like I was ready for college, so it seemed silly to waste time and money at some place like that until I was sure what I was working towards. Well, when you make it to your unit, and after you get settled in, you ask your sergeant about taking correspondence courses when you figure out your goals. You should be able to pick up at least an associate's degree at least, or even a bachelor's if you have some AP credits. That's how I picked up my degree while I was in the army. Don't let your education slide just because you're in the service. The man looked at his watch and rose from his stool. He waved down the server, grabbing his check as well as Jeff's. The younger man tried to protest. You're going to serve your country, son. I spent 20 years in the army as an infantryman during the worst of some anti-military times. I never heard so much as heard a single thank you pass anyone's lips to me, though I heard plenty of other not-so-nice things. The man shrugged. Wanting to hear thanks from others wasn't why I stayed in, but it would have been nice to hear, even just once. So let this be my way of getting your career started with a thank you for your service, okay? I've got to catch my connection to Savannah. You take care, son, and give it your best. The man walked off without giving Jeff time to thank him for his generosity. Jeff hadn't even asked the man his name. Jeff watched the man walk off before turning back to his root beer float and cheeseburger. He tried to ask the server for the man's name, but she shook her head. She overheard what the man told Jeff, and she'd seen the businessman do the same for other enlistees in the past. They'd looked as stunned as Jeff did. As the sister of two service members, she appreciated the older man's generosity. Jeff resolved to pay that generosity forward someday. An hour later, Jeff sat on a much smaller plane bound for Columbus, Georgia. He used the military travel voucher, which was free, but he'd have to pay for a hotel room until July 6th. He wasn't sure he had enough money, but he'd figure it out. It turned out his fears were unfounded. The manager at the hotel where Jeff made his original reservation had heard stories similar to Jeff's over the years. Jeff received an unanticipated room rate discount from the manager, which he half protested. Jeff later admitted the discount helped his money stretch until his report date and beyond. 
He would ship his extra clothes and personal items back to his house before reporting to Fort Benning. No way was he showing up with anything over and above the Army's packing list. Jeff settled into as much of a routine as he could over the next four days. He ran in the morning, did his exercises, ate, read, and slept. He found the closest laundromat and washed his extra clothes before shipping them home. Jeff checked out the morning of July 6, 1987, and thanked the manager for the discount once again. He carried his bag onto a city transit bus bound for the reception center at Fort Benning and the start of his adult life.